and we're, we're live, we're recording. Um, yeah, good. All right. So it's really funny because we were ch all chatting and laughing away, and then suddenly we were recording, and then everyone's like, <laughs> don't speak. <laughs> don't speak. <laughs> we're being monitored, we're being yeah. watched. Red light syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Red light syndrome, is that something from your past? It's, it's definitely it's to Amsterdam, been. wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been. Yeah, exactly. no, um, it's, it's sort of when, when we're recording music, um, it happens every time. It happens to me every time anyway. Uh, I seem to be able to play it perfectly when I'm practicing it. But then when we go to record it in, as soon as that red light goes on, I seem to screw up and can't remember what I'm playing. Does it, does, it add, does it add that extra little bit of pressure in some way, just knowing that you're being recorded compared maybe. to maybe if you're just jamming or singing your own or, or whatever you're doing, it adds that little that difference? Yeah, oh, maybe. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say necessarily, like, like because we know the people that record, we record with, I wouldn't necessarily say that I feel like I'm under pressure, but it, it must be a subconscious thing because I can't seem to play it whenever we record, which is not ideal. Well, you may not feel pressure. I feel pressure to just not have my voice break halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I feel like there's going to be a high note coming up. There's I'm been some sketchy myself. takes in the past. There have been some very yeah. bad takes in the past. <laughs> I think it's as because... soon as you know you're on the clock, you're, you know, you're not just playing around in your time. You've got someone else's time there that you're yeah. essentially wasting for every wrong take that you do. And <laughs> I think we do a couple, but we get by. We get well, one take wonders. What are you on about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Do one take, realize it's not going well, and we'll program it in later. <laughs> well, how, 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 how does that all work? So, like, when you are going to record uh, uh, and you just think, oh, this isn't going well, or we need to pivot and go on to the next track, how does that, what's the structure of when you're recording a single or an album? How does that look and feel? Um, I think the natural thing to do at the start is um, <clears throat> or certainly thing that our producer Simon did is he tried to make us feel as comfortable as possible. So everything's not too regimented or structured when we go in. Um, so he put on FIFA for us and stuff and we just play like a game or something. Um, basically get a friendly atmosphere going. Um, so that when we go into taking um, some recordings, it's not as pressured and if we do screw up a bit Simon's okay and he's fine with it and we just keep going through cycles um, I think it's all about just like making sure that we and him feel comfortable together it's like it's, it's a bit of a trust thing when recording mm. um, but I think if we realize that things aren't going too well um, Simon's very good at going right we'll just call it time for now let's have a break let's go for a coffee or something that's just um, have a game of FIFA or something. Um, especially for me, there was a point in our newest single where um, I was really pushing myself. And obviously, the more you push your voice, the more prone it is to breaking. <laughs> and he thought, yeah, okay, let's just call it a bit of time for now. And we just played a game of FIFA 10 minutes later. Did it in one take, I think. So it's a, It sounds like the making of your band is really associated around playing FIFA. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I don't know. I think there's only really two of us who really like football. <laughs> I hate FIFA. I, I, think it's, I suck it's, it. It's so bad. <laughs> like, I mean, I absolutely love FIFA. If anyone from FIFA's watching, send us some free stuff. But like, I, 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 it's just not the game for me. Um, I can't get my head around it. I haven't been able to get my head around it for the past, what, 10 years that it's been <laughs> since FIFA 12. Well, I'd say eight years then. Counting's difficult for me too, um, <laughs> but um, I just can't. I can't get my head around it. And then they release the same game every year, and um, so I, I'll stick with my war zone for now. I think. <laughs> yeah. So when, when you play, do you play against each other, or do you play on the same team? Like, what teams do you do you choose, tend to choose? What makes you makes you calm so you get get away from the music for a second? Well, uh, I'm a Chelsea fan, so I'll, I'll play as Chelsea. Mike's a Newcastle fan, so he doesn't tend to play as Newcastle because they're yeah, shite. Yeah, because they're awful. <laughs> <laughs> I'd lose. <laughs> Unless I'm, I mean, if I'm playing against Jamie, I know I need to pick a really good team because Jamie's a bit of a, a sweathead. <laughs> and he, uh, 
he absolutely smashes us out of FIFA. But if I'm playing against, no offence, but Charlie or Ollie or Ed, <laughs> <laughs> who maybe don't play it as much, <laughs> I can go a bit more relaxed and play as, you know, Macclesfield Town or something. Yeah, see, I'll go, I'll go for like a hometown team. I'll go for all the shot um, and, and just get absolutely <laughs> just clattered the whole way through. Or <laughs> equally, I'll go for a, you know, major league team, um, City or something, or Barcelona, and still get absolutely clattered. So <laughs> it really doesn't make a difference for me. <laughs> yeah, but I suppose if you, if you choose one of the smaller teams and you lose... Yeah, it was Macclesfield Town. <laughs> certain amount of acceptability on that sense. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Do you, do you find you have kind of quite a bit, bit of healthy competition between you as, as band members? Do you, is there a bit of camaraderie around, around that or is it mainly just associated to FIFA or is there other, other bits of other areas where you're competitive? I think we're pretty competitive anyway. Like, yeah. I think that's when we played mini golf on it on tour. <laughs> <laughs> think me and Ollie drew first. Yeah, my point is having became, none of it. Okay, rock bottom. <laughs> <laughs> golf is you weren't having a good time. <laughs> nah, it's not quite my sport. <laughs> Anything like that time at um, Top Golf where you were oh, on the floor and getting frustrated. <laughs> hey, I could say the same about you, Charlie. <laughs> I have oh, win. Yeah. I, I think we've I all seen that. <laughs> but no, I think as much as we have competition, I think there's more um, a unity especially when it comes to things like music. Um, I think one of the things that makes our band work so well is because we have this sort of almost telepathic uh, communication between each other. When things sound a bit rubbish, you'll just see everyone's faces go a bit like, mm. <laughs> nah, that's, not, that's not too good. Um, I feel like we know what makes each member tick now. So we know what to do. Um, but maybe, I don't know, Kedge is not having a, he's having a bit of an off day with recording. It's it's all about just take him out for a second and having him listen to the track back. Then he'll go back more refreshed. Um, I think we we definitely have a sort of com camaraderie around us. Hard words um, to pronounce. Mm. Yeah, that was quite difficult. <laughs> um, I, I was fearful when I attempted it a second ago, and then, it, then, it, then I, I, I was able to say it, and I got past it, and I was pleased. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and I'm, I'm nice to see that you stumbled. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we tend to stick with sort of one-syllable words in this band. It's about as much yeah. as <laughs> it's just a bunch of cavemen. I yeah. don't want to confuse Charlie or Kedge. <laughs> yeah, Kedge are the victims. <laughs> We should, we should talk about that that, that camaraderie. Cam camarade? No, I can't. I, I screwed that. No, camarade. Let's <laughs> call it French. I think one. we should all I think we should all try a three syllable word. Camarade. A four syllable. I can't, I can't camaraderie. <laughs> um, but I the, think the, as the, a group of friends, like we all kind of take the mick out of each other, which is good. We are more a friend a friendship as a over a band because there are quite a lot of bands in the industry who take being a band too seriously i, th I think um, that's a good point because it comes back to the you point comes back to the unity um so, so you talk about being friends so where, where did it like have you been friends for a long time how, how did that all, all all come about so how it kind of came about is uh me mike jay and steve um yeah sorry i forgot about him he's not here um <laughs> i think he got fired school. i don't think he he hasn't got a memory that he got fired <laughs> earlier <laughs> he's not here anymore he's um, gonna fight when he when this goes out on air live he's gonna find <laughs> out <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so all four of us went to school together um and between like me jane steve had music together me mike and steve had music tech together we kind of just used to jam take it as like a fun thing to do like when you're a kid everyone wants to be a band everyone thinks it's so cool and you don't think of how much work needs to go into it until like you get to like I wouldn't say our stage well yeah but um just how much you have to put invest your time your money and it's not a doddle um and where Ollie came in was I used to work at Sainsbury's Ollie used to work at Sainsbury's Ollie studied music at college and he was I believe a front man of his band yeah I was a guitarist um, I remember the day you, you, you came to me and you said, oh, Ollie, you play guitar, don't you? I was like, yeah. He was like, do you fancy your own bass? I was like, it's just an easier way of playing guitar. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and that was that. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that, 
and then it, since then as, as you as, as, since you've all been friends and you sort of fallen into how, how did you then define the roles is it just because you've, you've been friends and then you're like okay right ollie you play bass yeah okay that's that sounds right you know and then and then and then you sort of all naturally just found found your positions in some respects um how, how does that how does that happen, I suppose? Because, of course, you've got to learn the skill. You've got to be relentless at it to play the drums or bass or, or sing. You've got to be quite relentless to, to get that good at your, your piece in some ways. But it's, it's, it's interesting to see that kind of you've all been friends throughout that as well and it develop. Yeah, I mean, by the, by the time we'd actually sort of started jamming together, we all played our respective instruments anyway. So me and Charlie were guitarists. Um, Steve played drums and Mike was always known as the guy who could sing. So you sort of pulled him in, and mm. it, it's just sort of how it happened. Um, Mike also played the cello, but we didn't fancy it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks for mentioning that, mate. <laughs> you'd, you'd have had a really different sound. Yeah, yeah that would have been. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Maybe that could be an intro one day into one of your tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Mike walk on stage with a big ass cello. It's definitely again. something we haven't um, we haven't looked into far enough. I don't Ooh. think. <laughs> yeah, we haven't ventured into that yet. So, <laughs> mm. but I, th I think the um, I, I don't know. I I never used to really be out there with singing. I think it was very much Charlie and Jay who kind of roped me into it. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> "Come on, you know you want to sing," and I'm like. No, not really. I don't. I don't really sing. And they're like, "Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do." Trying to get me to practice was hard. <laughs> trying to get me to practice. Yeah, I was a bit. I was a bit um, flaky. What's the word? Flaky at the start. Mm. I think it's just because I didn't. I didn't think I could sing. And then the more we became a band, I think the more structured everyone's roles became. Um, and then obviously we we got Ollie in, which just kind of like cemented the sound. Um, and what was that like? Twenty thirteen. Yeah, um, yeah, not forgetting me and you went to college together as well, Mike. I know, yeah, yeah. Like, this is something that I realised, because I think I, I joined the band just after I left college. Yeah. Um, and there was, obviously, there was this kid in the year below us who had, like, a great set of pipes on him and could sing really well. And then Charlie was like, oh, yeah, come to band practice and we'll, we'll you know, we'll give you an audition, so to speak, and you can play along and learn a couple of our songs. I turn up and Mike's there and I was like, oh, that's a kid from college with a great voice. So <laughs> I think that's... Um... I know, yeah, that's something that... Um, yeah, that's a piece of history that kind of gets forgotten about, doesn't it? Yeah, it slips under the radar. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it was definitely a, um, a divide between our two years in terms of um, social groups. We didn't really oh, yeah. mingle at all, but uh, there was definitely a a certain element of respect you'd hear people practicing and you'd hear people doing bits in the studio and stuff and um fortunately i found the guy with a good voice so it was it was it was a happy Stop happy going to the top. <laughs> yeah. <Stop. laughs> but yeah i mean like and that's that's another thing that's quite useful in the band i suppose and especially in the reimagined sessions that we've been doing is that although we've been in lockdown luckily between us because we've done music technology and music as uh, core subjects in school and university and things, uh, we've had sort of the collaborative skills to kind of like <laughs> push something out there without necessarily having to go to Simon um, for it, which is great. Mm. <laughs> because obviously we can't get to Simon. <laughs> we can't record it. Yeah. I'm uh, just going to butt in there um, because people might get confused who Simon is. Uh, <laughs> Simon is a guy called Simon Jackman. He's the front man of a band called Viridian and he works at Our House Studios. He's like an amazing music producer. Mm. Mm. I was going to, actually, I had him down, funny enough, in some of my notes. And when I was, I was sort of having a think about sort of some, some of the, uh, the obviously, the bands is, is what we all see, but then it was the people that sit, sits behind. And I, I'd noticed, noticed Simon, of course, was involved. What's it been like working with him? Easy. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seamless. Um, I think the hardest thing about getting to work with Simon is literally getting to Simon. Um, and then from then on, it's just a breeze. You know, like, like we said, he makes you, he puts you at ease. The moment you, you walk in there, you know, you've got something either, you know, you can record straight away, you can get straight set up, uh, or he'll kind of be just putting put the finishing touches of the beginning of the project together. Um, so, you know, you're, 
gives you a bit of time to just familiarise yourself, almost put a game plan together for the day um, between ourselves and the band, um, and then says, right, what's first? What do you guys fancy first? He'll obviously put his own recommendations in there, um, and generally we're, mere, we're, we're more than willing to uh, ha- take any help we can get in that sense. Um, but uh, then from then on, it's just a breeze, which is really nice in terms of um, you know, how, how you want a recording session to go or any kind of session where you've got a product at the end of it, like a music video or whatever. They can be quite stressful, but recording sessions with him, nice and simple. It's just organized, isn't it? Mm. That's, that's the, not to say like we've had, we were very, very lucky to also have a mixer called Daniel Reed. Mm. who uh, was the, am I right in saying the lead guitarist of a band called No Consequences yeah. uh, mm. quite a while ago. Um, and f- funnily enough, we just, we simply transitioned from Dan to Simon just purely because of time. Um, Dan had a new job and things and it just couldn't, we couldn't structure a time where we could go with Dan. Mm. And we knew about Simon's accolades and what he'd uh, produced we'd obviously gigged with Viridian as well. Um, and as a singer, I was quite desperate to get in with Simon because he's a brilliant vocalist and he knows what makes an amazing melody. So like, um, when we got there, it's just so organized. And I think he also appreciated the fact that we came organized. We had the demo already set. Um, and everything was just kind of about recording it rather than him having to actually produce it, which I think was, Saved a lot of time for him and yeah. probably... So, talk, talk, because this is really interesting, certainly for other people in other bands that, you know, aspire to be more like yourselves. What does that structured recording day look like? So, you know, you, you go off and you, you meet with Simon and, you know, I, I don't know what sort of hours you're, you're doing or, or, or whatever, but what you, you're talking about structure as being the real positive thing about it. What, what, what is that structure? How does, it, how does it actually happen on the day? So, so the um, best thing... Oh, you go, Jeff. Go on, no, go on. Go on. I said the best thing probably to do with. Both have your opinions. (laughs) (laughs) The best thing I'd say is go prepared. So, as Mike was saying, we could go in with a demo. um, And this isn't like a scratch kind of phone recording as such or like a practice recording. We'll go and like do our takes on our, like previously, to kind of set out the structure of the song with um, a kind of base to kind of grow from. Um, to like Simon puts his touch on it, brings it to life. We change certain things, but knowing to go in with something is definitely when you're going for a recording is the way to go. Unless sure. you're doing like a a pre-production session where you're writing with the producer, that's a kind of a different stage. Um, but how we kind of approached it is go in there with that. Um, Mike's amazing with his mixing and stuff as well. Um, he went to university with it, so he has kind of a very music tech mindset with kind of our demos as well um and the way it kind of always goes is our structure um is you have a drum day um so you record your drums first they are the ba- um the backbone of a song then you go in with your bass your guitars and then finally your vocals and then you layer your layers of, like, of synths and stuff after um that's really interesting actually because i obviously i i'm i, I from from the outside i wouldn't know that that that's how it's done you often just mm. think okay a band goes in they record their song that's how it's done but actually what you're saying here is is that actually it, it's all recorded as separate components yeah yeah and yeah. then it's then um, it's then it's layered so it's recorded then it's laid on top that's really interesting i, I never, never would have known that yeah so i think one thing one thing that we do rather well with our our demos is that we um we have uh, click tracks. Um, we have a set tempo that we know we're working to so that when you go into the studio and you've got uh, the drummer laying down his tracks, he's already got a track with that tempo and, uh, and the click track and potentially even the, the drums that we've, we've worked on previously for. Um, he's already got that in his ears. So he can kind of play along to the song as we had it previously. And then you know, as you work on the bass later on and the guitars later on and, you know, vocal melodies and then start to layer things up together. That's when parts can change and differ from the demo. Um, and so that's where it kind of, uh, there's an element of development in the studio rather than just recording the song 
as a song. Um, that's when it develops from a demo into, you know, a song that you come out and you say, oh, actually, that sounds that sounds pretty pretty wicked. I'm, you know, I'm really happy with the results. Um, and uh, I think that's something we've always done pretty well is get a good <laughs> demo between ourselves, just recording little tracks, you know, on our own computers, um, and then and then going in there with something that the producer can see where we're going at, and then gives us uh, a, a lot more time to um, make our own alterations if, if we wanted to, um, because we're not sat there trying to think, right, how can we get this, why can't we get this, uh, this drum track like perfectly synced up um, for what we wanted to do. Yeah. And just, think, just, is the outcome of that then it feels more polished? So it's, yeah. just, it's just tighter as a track because it's been produced in that way? Um, yeah. yeah, I think there's, there's, it certainly comes out more polished um, than, than our, our demos. Everything is more polished than our demos. Um, <laughs> but uh, then also, like I say, in that time, you can, you can develop parts of the song. So where you may have had a, a, a bridge in the song previously that, you know, was just a short little, um, short little break. Um, you, you know, Simon or whoever the producer may be at the time, um, may turn around and say, oh, you know what would be really nice here? Just like a little um, a, a vocal melody break or something or just a, a synth break. And that's when it starts to um, become more than the demo that we had previously as well. So that's when you can make the changes as well. So, um, and then, I think that's on. one thing that sort of really impressed me when we went to work with Simon is that straight off the bat, as soon as you record it in, it sounds polished and it sounds, it sounds so clean. Uh, I've never heard anything quite like that. Like, um, for example, if I'm recording at home, um, you'd need to do quite a lot to it to make it sound good. Um, but <laughs> go, going in with Simon, as soon as you record in, it sounds like once all the components are together without even the mix or master being done, it sounds like a polished track, which mm. in, in itself sort of, sort of a blueprint for, for a, a good song, really. Well, he knows mm. how to... The, the, yeah, that, that's like the main part. Um, if you can, literally the first like process of the recording process is obviously the musicians need to be good because there's, there's very little that you can do about like a bad guitarist, a bad bassist, a bad drummer, or especially a bad singer, you know, obviously you can splash some auto tune on. Um, but I think the thing with exactly what Jamie's saying is Simon knows how to record in with certain microphones, certain cabs, certain amps. He knows what microphone to use for a vocalist. I think he had actually a few arrays of microphones that he could have used for me, but he chose one specifically. Um, so he's, I think with the demo, he can already hear the impression that we want, the ideas that we want. If we can make the demo as good as possible, it gives the producer, as in Simon, the creativity to hear okay, they want the guitar to sound similar to that. They want the drum beat to sound or have that sort of rhythmic tempo. They want the vocals to be that clean in this section, but maybe a bit distorted in this section. Um, so it allows them a lot of creativity. If we can do as much of the uh, bulk of the work as possible initially, he has more time to be more creative, uh, which is what we like from a producer anyway. We like their sort of artistic impression on our tracks. The, the interesting thing you said there is that when you're going to record your vocals, you've got an, uh, an array and a few, an option mm -hmm. of what microphone you're going to, you're going to work with. Exactly. How do you, how do you get to that point of making that decision? And, and is it somehow, obviously the, the sound must come out differently based on what, what, what brand you're using or what style you're using. Precisely. I think with um, I think with Simon, he used the microphone that he used for himself vocally. Um, I think certainly my point of view is like you know when, whenever I've done a mix or anything, you as long as you have can kind of experiment with different microphones, you know which ones like suit certain vocals. So like if for example you're uh, trying to record something that's kind of harsh like a distorted vocal something that's like a screamer vocal you choose something like a dynamic microphone just because it can take a high sound pressure level for example you can get proper close and like aggressive but if you want something a bit cleaner you'd probably go with something like well like that like a neumann <laughs> because mm. it's nice clean it's a cardioid condenser it means you can get the nice little high detail on and that's exactly what um simon used for me 
um, and it's a bit different because you can actually hear if you listen to our co Consequences EP and then Haunting Me, which were done by different producers, you can hear that my vocals sound slightly different. And that's purely down to the microphone that's used to record it in. Obviously, mixing comes into it as well. But like, as I said, if you can get like the perfect match, especially for a vocals, if you can get the perfect match of microphone to voice, the mixing becomes almost seamless. Um, and I think Simon knew that because he is a vocalist himself, which is why I was so eager to, for us to get in with him. Mm. Definitely. I think he, he knows a lot because he's done so much mixing for other bands. There was a band, is it Acres? I think it's Acres. Yeah. Isn't it? a lot. yeah. Acres, who um, I remember Charlie showed me and I was like ridiculously impressed. Um, and that's initially what made me think, oh my God, Simon's brilliant. He could get us to that level of sound, you know, like <laughs> that's, that's where we want to be. So I think a lot of it is like his, his own knowledge of that microphone would probably work for you. Um, and he got it right, <laughs> by my opinion anyway. What, what tracks and albums has he worked with you on? Um, so if we're going through what's on Spotify, what's, what's, what's been produced by Simon? It's just haunting me, isn't it? It's just our new single. Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. um, just, just the one, just the one track. Just the one track so far. Um, we are planning to obviously go back within, well, at the end of this lockdown period. Mm. I think <laughs> um, we've got we've got a penciled in come whenever you can date sort of, yeah, in, the, yeah. in the works. Yeah, subject to change or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, certainly. Like you can hear there's a difference in mixing, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's you know any better or any worse it's just dan had his style of mixing simon had his style of mixing and it's just different levels of things and how they mix it in accordance to what you want it is like if you have an idea like i certainly wanted <laughs> probably because i'm a little uh, egotist um, I wanted my vocals to be a bit higher in the mix because <laughs> I'm a vocalist and that's that's what we do with divas and Simon took that on board um, and obviously did what he, he did um, so yes I think Dan's worked on every other one on Spotify I think uh, yeah 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 it is isn't it yeah yeah apart from the reimagined sessions that we've Puffed. we've done ourselves yeah yeah we've did that ourselves you know, it's the difference. We should, <laughs> yeah. we should talk through what's available so people can have a listen to. So what, from what's on Spotify, so where did it all start? Like what was the first one that you what was, record, what was recording? So you've got, so I go here, you've got Consequences, and that says that's uploaded in 2016. You've got Colours, Your Colours, sorry, Haunting Me, um, Reimagined Sessions. So to talk, talk me through sort of how, how all of that uh, has come around, come about. So we actually did a, a like an EP before Consequences when we first started years back, but um, that's not on there anymore, and there's probably a reason for it. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the first release on Spotify is Consequences, which was recorded with Dan Reed, um, and then prior to that, there were two singles which aren't on. Uh, Spotify but they're on our YouTube which is called Man This Dog and Where We Like To Be they were also recorded with Dan they were kind of like the first things we did with him they were like, like the testers that. weren't they yeah. yeah it was just kind of to see where it was the way kind of we work with Dan is um, I used to work with him in Sainsbury's as well so it kind of you all kind of know people when you get in and he was like I record my band when we do your band we we're like yeah go for it yeah cool. um, and then trying to think what's after that after was Your Colours, which was also recorded with Dan Reed. Um, that was 2018, I want to say, was it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Is that what it says on Spotify? Yeah, so you, yeah, Your Colours 2018, that's when it was uploaded. Yeah, so yeah, and then that one, and then after that was Haunting Me, which was Simon, and now the reimagined sessions that we've brought out while in lockdown. So that's kind of the order of everything. How, how did you release, so that must have, was that recorded prior of course to lockdown then, so you, had, you recorded it but then it's just, you know, we've been here now, now we've been able to, to release it, how did, how did that happen? Oh, we, we recorded it in lockdown. You actually recorded yeah. during lockdown? Yeah. yeah. 
So individually, not individually, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> so she's oh, wow. into all the, you know. Well, I was, I was going to ask you as a band, how do you cope with lockdown? And, you know, does that stunt your ability to be able to practice and record and play together? But talk me through that, because that's, that's really interesting that you've still been able to record and release, release something during lockdown. It's kind of weird because we've actually become more efficient at writing since we've been in lockdown. I don't really know how it's happened, but it just, it just seemed to be the way it's gone. But with our reimagined sessions, um, Mike's produced it. So Mike, Mike's sort of mixed and mastered everything um, and any parts that we need to add. So Charlie would put his guitar in, I'll put my guitar in, Ollie put his bass in. Um, and we just sort of recorded at home um, in, our, in our living rooms, so to speak. And then ah, I'm with Mike you. All right. So, magic. so you've effectively recorded it separately. So you've written it, you've written the tracks, you've recorded it at home into your own systems. And then, of course, then you upload it and you think that's how you've been able to mix it all together. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So how the reimagined sessions are, they are our old songs, just reworked. So they are essentially pre-written. Um, it's just, we just kind of changed them up. How they kind of are. So the first one we released was the Haunt Me Piano track, which is just purely Mike. Mike playing the piano, Mike singing, and he smashed it. Hmm. And then the second track was, what's the one that's out at the moment? Ocean. Ocean, which is more of a pop punky acoustic kind of style. Um, which has got all of us on it, I believe. Yeah? Not Kedge. Not Kedge. Oh, and not Ollie. I don't think bass is in it either. No, it's just two, two guitars. Jay's playing the electric, I'm the acoustic. My backing vocals and Mike's main vocals. And then, when's the next one out? Get it July, really... I believe. Yeah. Oh, oh, 3rd of July. Is, yeah. This, is this an exclusive? Do your fans know this, that you're going to have a track out 3rd of July? Uh, they I mean, know one's coming, but they don't know what the date is. Uh, it's exc we it's exclusive. Yeah. We've got it. <laughs> yeah, <we get> <laughs> so oh, I, need, I just needed, you know. So I've got Steve's been fired. Third of July is the new is the new the new singles coming out. Brilliant. We, you know, our job's done today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. if if we can upload this on like on the 3rd of July as the new single comes out, then that's a great day for Steve. So. <laughs> 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 the, the, the third track coming out is very different um, yeah. something completely different to what we've done before um, are we it's, talking about it? well it, yeah we might as well I, I don't think it's that much of a big secret to be no, honest no yeah, uh, so the track that we've reworked is Breathe It In uh, the original is more of a kind of like rocky ballad sort oh, of yeah. vibe where this one's a very kind of distancey, reverby, kind of detached um, version of it. Um, it's like an ambient yeah. track, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's cool. Wow, it's just, do you, do you, was that quite intentional then to release quite a different sound? Yeah. Um, and do you, do you feel that your fans wanted to hear a different sound or do you feel that just, that's just your progression as a band, to, you know, to start touching on to different, different music? I oh, think it's... Um, go on, sorry. You, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I think with us, we always wanted to produce some acoustic tracks of our own because actually in the early stages of the writing process, a lot of the tracks were acoustic before they were performed electrically. Um, so it would be Charlie, Jamie or whoever would produce an acoustic version and then we'd make it electric. I think our writing process has changed, but we still love acoustic tracks we still love acoustic songs and especially in lockdown we thought there's no real better time we have the resources we have the guitars we have our instruments we have the microphones we might as well just do it <laughs> you know now is better than any other time um and i think for our fans and people who follow us um we just also wanted to let them know that we are still here we are still <laughs> we're still trying to make music <laughs> we still exist um so it's it's nice to be able to kind of like rehash versions of old songs and bring them back to the forefront again um i think it's also a way of keeping us busy as well because uh, it was it was at the, at the beginning of this whole lockdown situation it was very easy to just slip into a routine of you know uh, for me, for example, I was still working um, for the first sort of nine weeks of it. Um, but then outside of work, I, I really didn't have anything to do. I couldn't go out and see my friends, couldn't go out and do much. Um, and so having that kind of side project of all these, these reimagined tracks that we had in the works um, 
kind of kept us in touch as a band, um, kept us busy as ba as a band as well, and you know made sure we all had something to kind of work towards at some point or another, um, and it kept us communicating. You know, as much as I'd like to think we'd all, you know, stay in our group chat and just chat away anyway, as we generally do. Um, you know, there's there's certain times where, you know, me for example, I, I quite often just go off the radar, and I'll, I'll just I won't won't be vocal for a couple of days at a time, and I'll kind of come back. Um, and so this this that especially during lockdown is something that um, it's good to have the projects there to work on, so that you kind of have to stay engaged. Um, and that, yeah, I think so. It's been kind of um, cathartic in a way for us. I can imagine. I can imagine that that just just having something productive to come back to. You know, lockdown is a difficult time for for lots of different reasons, and it's obviously the isolation piece is. But I imagine as a band where you enjoy, you know, your friends, you enjoy each other's company, you want to be around each other, and of course, I don't know how often you'd be recording each week and typically getting together, but no, no doubt it's a lot. But then, and then suddenly not to have that connection. I think the, yeah. you know that the, the great thing for you is is that you can still, you know, be agile in some respect and say, right, we're still going to produce something and we're still going to get something out there for, for your own sanity as well, as well as your fans wanting to still hear from you. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. I think there's a certain of a certain amount of you know keeping ourselves busy that was um, so in, in a way it's sort of selfish, but at the same time if we can produce something that um, is going to be different and entice more people potentially um introduce more people to our sound um and then we'll totally take them away from the sound that we've given them a taste of later on down the line but um i mean you know i think for the fans and us it's been uh, very productive do, do you do you find that you say it's been productive and i think you alluded to this earlier in some respect that you know you, you need to keep working keep doing things but actually if you, you've, you've started producing or has it given you because people do have more time on their hands has it enabled you to think actually i'm going to write that track that i wanted to i'm going to get these lyrics down or i'm going to play this guitar. Has, has it sort of naturally allowed you to start doing that more because you've got a little bit of time back uh, yes and no so um i i've been like furloughed myself so i've been completely free um so i've had so much time to kind of feel but then to write music whereas you look at other members like jay his works become harder i think and longer days mm -hmm. so there's completely two sides of the spectrum with yeah. this lockdown so some people are free and bored and don't know what to do and some people are getting even more work and it's just kind of finding the balance between them as such that's what i kind of think of this whole lockdown and then and then creatively you know you're not quite a lot you know often write about stuff that you know your experience you're out and and stuff and then, but of course now you're locked down and, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you're so not how, experiencing anything <laughs> you don't know, experience it so how do you write creatively in this kind of situation i guess it's like concept writing so you don't write from a personal experience or what's going on with you as such you have like an idea of a concept of a feeling of a situation and you write around that and kind of structure it around like a story writing at the end of the day um you kind of make up a character in your mind and that's what the song is but then yeah. saying that i feel with lockdown it allows you maybe you know potentially hazardously to reflect on everything that you did before lockdown so because you know the the life that we lead after lockdown will be probably comparatively for a lot of people, starkly different to what they're used to. So I think, well, even, even for me, like lyric writing, music writing, um, you do also kind of focus on some of the things that happened before lockdown and maybe it gets heightened because you now have more time to think about those things. Um, or you feel better because you're like, well, before lockdown, this and this was happening. After lockdown, maybe, communities will be more harmonious and you know maybe the world will be a bit cleaner and you know you, you draw some positives out of it um but i think for us essentially a lot of our songs have been um very much storytelling from somebody else's point of view it may be uh a friend or it may be somebody that we know of somebody in the news 
but a lot of our songs aren't actually ridiculously personal to us. Only like a select few will be quite personal accounts of what we've been through. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and, 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 yeah. and that's, that's interesting because typically you're right, bands write about themselves, their personal experience, singers are singing about things that they've been through. Um, but you're saying that actually, you know, people you're connected to, it's actually you're, you're taking their stories and then putting them into your, into your lyrics um, and into, into your sounds. Um, and, and any tracks in particular that that sort of relates to that you've gone or that it was that that situation happened and actually that that's kind of depicted into this particular song yeah i can already see jamie thinking of one <laughs> <laughs> so um I'll, i might as well say it so uh breathe it in yeah i was gonna say that, that one that track is very much about uh that's, that's basically my point of view lyrically from seeing some people that i knew some friends that i had um, and their problems with addiction to drugs and alcohol and the change that occurs from when you knew them, when they were clean and sober and happy to that kind of that transition where they've almost been uh, taken over in, in a sort of uh, comatose state from drugs and alcohol. Um, but that was very much a, a, a sort of outsider's opinion on how their life is doing um it was basically it was a few friends in particular a few people that i knew of um but i think all of us as band members potentially related to that because we all knew of people that had been in similar situations um and that's the nice thing about it if we can pick up on other people's sounds bad but like their problems and stuff it must be a more global problem you know people suffer with alcoholism and drug addiction and things we don't necessarily try to write about in incredibly topical situations but it's just things that affect us from the outside looking in if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah i mean the, the sort of things that you're talking about are global aren't they you know that yes. people do struggle with drugs and alcohol i mean that's that's pretty well known and documented and i'm sure we all know people that, that have been, been in those situations before. I've, I've, I've had <laughs> my, my time of, of, of uh, going out and partying and staying up all weekend and doing things as well. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's part of growing up, right? It's part, part, of, part of becoming an adult and going through it. The challenge yeah. is when it goes beyond recreational and it's Tuesday and then Wednesday is Thursday as well. And it's, it's, it, this yeah. all goes beyond recreational going out. That also must be really difficult for you as a band in some ways because, you know, you're, you're a you're you're a band you're on stage and, and every, you know you're, you're you are the life and center of a party but then does that change your approach to it and think you know what guys we can't drink or actually is that part of your part of who you need to be as, as part of your persona because there's got to be a show element and people go oh, i want to listen to a band that rocks and drinks and they're like this but quite often you find the reality of that can be quite different yeah um i think that can that definitely can vary from show to show um, so say we've got a gig up in, um, I think it was Newcastle under line, um, that we played, uh, the rigger up there. And then no, um, I've, 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 I've had many nights out in Newcastle and <laughs> they like to party, right? Oh, so, it's, so it's, you, it's not that Newcastle. It's, yeah, it's, <laughs> oh, it's, it's, a weird little, <laughs> it's a weird little Newcastle that we'd never heard of before. I just heard Newcastle. I didn't hear the rest. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, a place called Newcastle under line. Um, I think it's near um, Stoke. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we I, I'd never heard of it before. Um, For the record, was, I've never been out in Stoke. <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, surely you'd want to, to be fair, <laughs> after the day we spent there. Oh, man, it was it was great. a great little venue. Um, I mean, when when we first turned up, there was there was obviously some shady goings on um, outside of the venue. Literally, <laughs> someone just sat on the like the doorstep of the venue, um, and then someone waiting closer to the curb um take from that what you will what was going on but we kind of had an idea of what was going on and we were like oh this is a bit shady but we knew from the outset that we were having to drive back to gloucestershire that night uh, was gloucestershire? That oh night. that was home that night yeah. yeah we we had like a three four hour drive ahead of us so you know we couldn't drink we couldn't you know take the party to newcastle for whatever reason you know we still um try and bring as much energy to it as we can but then you can't you know you can't let your responsibility go out the window 
however if we have a hometown gig in farnborough um yeah we'll sing some pints um, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, um we'll, we'll you know we'll try and have as, as as good a time as we can with it um and you know bring the energy that way because we know we can probably sort out a lift home afterwards maybe <laughs> um do you, do you find your performances are different on those nights that night in stoke where you guys got like guys this is a gig we've got to we've got to provide a performance but there's probably you no know, we can't get involved in the party tonight but but then you're playing at farnborough or you know obviously be love locally from blazing stoke you're playing at those types of gigs you think you know this is a hometown gig they like us they know us we can go out and we can have a few drinks does that change your performance in some way uh, kind of yes and no uh, yeah, kind try of. to let it not change the performance yeah. but there's probably uh you know if, if you were an outsider looking in you probably notice the difference fairly quickly i would say um uh, i would i would also say that we tend to not drink before a performance so um because i mean we, we have done before and it's not ended well <laughs> so, <laughs> that was years ago <laughs> so yeah we, we kind of made a rule to not drink or not have more than yeah more i think it's like a one or two pint limit he's he's only allowed two yeah (laughs) (laughs) i I feel like you're referring to some an incident that happened (laughs) so it'd be wrong of me not to inquire uh yeah (laughs) fine so so what happened what happened years ago when you've had a few drinks so we were invited to play uh raw holloway summer ball (laughs) um which is like their big kind of leavers event really good and we played one their acoustic stage um, I had contacts in the university because I used to do their event work, and um, we had to do. We did our set; it was great. And then the manager came over. He was like, "Here you go, boys. Here's a big crate of beer. Have fun." And then later in the night, um, one of the bands didn't show up, so they needed to fill the slot. So I can't remember which member it was, but in a very drunken state, one member said, "Yeah, we'll fill it again," um, and we went on. And um, there was definitely a good few swing beats from Stephen Cage. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was horrendous. Yeah, yeah no, was I was I, like, I was not in a state where I should be playing a guitar, let alone in front of people. And I think the audience definitely reflected that at some point. Um, you know, there was that they heard music, they came over at some points. Um, bearing in mind, it's very open format. It's your, you know, you're playing a little acoustic tent out to a field, and you know, there's some chairs in front of you. And there were some people that kind of came over in dribs and drabs and, uh, you know, maybe heard a couple of minutes of us and decided that, well, uh, they yeah, they drink. That's people dancing. And uh, yeah, exactly. I remember I was sober because I was driving. And I remember looking over to Mike being like, the world needs to swallow me up. Like, yeah, it's yeah. horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone kind of went to the main stage anyway, because do, do you remember um, uh, Rizzle, Rizzle Kicks? Playing. Yeah. Rizzle Kicks. And the, uh, that pop group Rizzle Kicks uh, that's on yeah. with the trumpets yeah they they were on the main stage so everyone went to see them <clears throat> kind of a bit thing. depressing but, uh, oh yeah they were on at the exact same time as us weren't they yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it weren't yeah. originally and then we were nice and we swapped with another artist oh with, with a uni crowd that's a tough gig to be competing with <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's really unfair to someone do that yeah I mean there was how many how many there was probably a good few five five thousand i think students yeah, there between um, the two main quads yeah yeah and uh just so happened that as soon as as soon as we came on they split between just one main quad and that was the the one we weren't playing in um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it's but, probably uh, a good thing right <laughs> yeah i mean it wasn't yeah. a bad thing the people who the people who came and sat and watched us seemed to enjoy it um and if you went and watched rizzle kicks well that's on you <laughs> <laughs> where are they now <laughs> probably further yeah. than us still so. yeah way further than us <laughs> I actually made Rizzle Kicks I thought they were great guys yeah, me too. <laughs> but getting back to how the gigs kind of go when we were saying about the rigger um, the annoying thing about the rigger was um, it was a great show and I think you three left but, and it was me and Kedge stayed a little bit longer and there was like an after party sort of thing going on and like yeah. all like emo bangers and stuff. Me and Ked were like, we wish we could have a drink right now. <laughs> like this was the night before we were playing B-Love. So we had to make the three hour journey down, make sure that we were good for the morning and uh, and play the festival. So yeah, I think you I, get I think moments like that about... when you're on the road where you're kind of like, I wish I could actually party. So it's not always that fun being the rock star touring around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we got home at about 
half two, three ish in the morning then. Yeah. And then obviously had to be left at the love for sort of midday, I think, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, I think we left for um, like nine, ten and got there, got our pack testing of all the equipment. And yeah. All the things that go on with the lovely festivals. Oh, yes. Which would be yeah. great if we had a tour driver. That would be. Yeah. Which could also have a have a repercussion effect in that we would also be hungover and probably <laughs> terrible instrumentalists when we got to the next show. But you know, rock star. What was <laughs> the second that's, day? That's exactly how rock stars typically are. But I imagine that's the next evolution of it. Uh, <laughs> I, I can only imagine it's going to have a detrimental effect in some way. Yeah. Certainly on your vote. Certainly on vocal cords. Oh, but, God, uh, yeah. What What do you find? So, is there a a type of crowd or like that you prefer um, so i mean yeah you know, when, when you're playing of course you can be at a uni type gig or you could be at a festival where does your sound best heard so i, I i'm sure i've saw you a couple of years ago i'm say a couple of years ago at b love i think um i know and you guys were great there i can't remember which year it was and and th- but then obviously you talk about the gig at Stoke or, or wherever else you're going. Is there like a type of venue that that's better for your sound, or do you prefer the festivals? Where do, where do you like to be heard? Festivals are always fun because they're like bigger stages and more people seem to be enjoying it. You get a bit more movement, I'd say, because people are having a few more drinks at a festival rather than like a, an evening gig or something like that. So I'd probably say that's pretty good. But the I'd say the issue with a festival is you're very detached from the people. So like where you play like a, a venue show, you'll go to your merch table after and like you can get a bit more crowd interaction and you get like fans coming up to you wanting pictures and stuff and like saying like how much our music means to them, which is always like the amazing thing with our music that we always find. Um, I think that's one of our main reasons why we write our music is like for other people to get stuff out of it rather than just us. Mm. Um, so that's the two sides. like. The, the playing is more fun at a festival, but I kind of prefer to meet the people that like our music at our shows um, and actually have a talk with them. I think our tradesmen's arms shows have always been the most fun for me. Um, and I think that's purely because it's, you know, it's, a, it's very much a hometown crowd. So you've got your, your friends, your family and whatever. And where it's held in a pub, everyone is just absolutely leathered um, <laughs> yeah. um, which you know if if we hit a bum note for any 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 reason no one's going to notice like no <laughs> um but um you know you get a hot sweaty crowd everyone's singing along what they know um enjoying the show and then you know like you say you get that interactiveness after the show where you know we're stacking down gear and you've got all your friends coming up to you going oh that's brilliant you know really great they're, that's probably my personal favourite kind of show, um, but we try and keep them down to sort of once or twice a year just to uh, keep the novelty fresh, I guess, in that respect. Absolutely. And what 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 gigs? Obviously, it's it's all changed now. You can't be outside. We can't be playing. But what what gig you have booked? I mean, is is there quite is there a roster of, of things that you're you play when you're typically playing? Um, and you know, what what were you booked up to be doing this year? We did have sort of like a mini tour um, in the works for sort of September time, but that's been put on hold. Um, we don't really know what's happening with that now, mm. um, but that was something to look forward to. Um, so what did, did that, what did that consist of? So, I mean, uh, no doubt no, a lot of things are being put into next year now, unfortunately, aren't they? But because uh, mm. you just can't, can't get the planning around it. But so, so where, where was that tour going to be? Uh, we didn't actually have, I don't think we actually had any locations um, Sort I think of they got finalised and then dropped pretty quick. Yeah, yeah. so like... Uh, it was going to be like four or five days. Yeah, a few people were sort of hesitant to, <clears> to book. So <throat> um, we didn't have any that sort of confirmed dates. So obviously um, we'd have to speak to John about that because he had all the details and then all kind of went to, went to pot with the lockdown situation. But I think with our, the typical mould for our tours is we like to kind of like cover quite a fair bit of area Mm -hmm. so we'd like to go from south to north for example or um, obviously logistically traveling wise it has to be doable Mm -hmm. but we like to try and cover as many different cities and different areas as possible so that we can kind of like if, if we did the same tour again or if we needed to if we wanted to go back 
people still remember us from, I don't know, anywhere from what Bridgewater to Newport to, uh, well, yeah, Newcastle on the line. line. <laughs> we played Leeds, we played Southampton, all over the place, really. Yeah. Played a couple of times in Southampton, haven't we? Mm. Yeah, we've done that. The Hobbit. The Hobbit, yeah, that was, a, was a, that was a funny one. That's a, that's really, great. that's a brilliant pub. Like, it as far didn't as you buy pub. like loads of people Jaeger bombs or something. Yeah, I tried buying fifty Jaeger bombs and said if you come in and I think they were like one pound fifty Jaeger bombs. So you know, I, I was I was more than happy to um, get people inside, but because it was obviously a summer's evening, people didn't Bacon. want to be inside. They wanted to be out in the pub garden. Um, so I went and tried to buy fifty Jaeger bombs, and he said, "No, I'm not serving you that." <laughs> and I was like, well, why? Like, you know, they're not, they're not for me. They're for other people in the pub. And he was like, nah, like, it's just, it's just it'll take too long for me to serve them. Can't, I can't bother. And I was like, everyone. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, and so I, was, just, I was kind of... Just, kind of on like, the, just on the number, do you not then think, okay, what about 40? Or well, this 30, is it. Or 35. I ended, up, I ended up getting them down to 25. Um, <laughs> and so I bought 25 egg ones. I went out into the uh, sort of back area of it, which was... Um, Huge. Like a tiered um, garden down to almost like a big concrete section with loads of benches and stuff. I just kind of shouted at them that there's three egg bombs inside. Um, so come in and see us. And uh, yeah. They did? It filled up. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> they, uh, they, they filled up. They had the egg bombs and then off they went. But um, no, that was a good yeah. kick, that one. And then someone tried to steal from us. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, guys. Like we we had a a display shirt, which is um, one of our one of our nicest tie dyes that I think we've we've had. Um, it was it was a red one, I think that one. Um, yeah. But uh, and at, at the end of us playing, we were like, "Well, we're missing a shirt. Has anyone sold that shirt? That was a really nice one." And uh, we couldn't. No, no one sold the shirt. So we were like, "Oh, that's been nicked." And uh, I walked out into the garden. And this guy has kind of seen me look at their table and then moved his hoodie. And I was like, I bet it's under that hoodie. <laughs> sort of walked over, lifted up his hoodie, uh, and there was our shirt. I just, I just grabbed it, took it back in. Um, he ended up coming and apologizing, actually, um, which was really good of him to steal and then apologize. <laughs> well, he was like, it was a dare or a joke. And then yeah. he gave us 50 euro note. And yeah, he was like, like what? Euro <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, okay, we'll take that. <laughs> okay, the expensive cool. shirt we've ever sold. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it was legit. Like... It's, a, it's, a, it's a guilt sell. So. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> he, I think, um, you know, because uh, I was chatting to the bouncer about it later on. He was like, who was it? Tell me. I was like, no, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Like, it's, it's not an issue. He's paid his debt, but. Just, um, paid three times as much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you're in debt to him now. Did you give him two other shirts to cover cover up? <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd give him tenner to run in the far di- run in the other direction. It's, 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 it's a slightly bizarre situation. I'm, I listen. I know people come to these gigs and get drunk and have fun and everything else. But you think, mm. well, I mean, even if they've done it for a, for a, for a joke, they obviously they're your fans. Then to steal something from you, <laughs> it, yeah. Well, he I mean, definitely fact, wasn't a fan. He was well, uh, just he, a random phone. <laughs> he, it happened while we were on stage, so he was obviously in there watching us, and then decided, ah, I'm going to steal their stuff. Why not? Why not? You know. <laughs> Like, there was, was, was there a moment in his mind where he went, ah, these guys are awful, I'm stealing their stuff and I'll be off. <laughs> um, but the fact that he then stole our stuff and stuck around about five feet away from us was, was the most... Um, that was bizarre. Again, yeah, well, the, the, the strangest part of it all. Well, we should take a chance to say that these shirts are available on your website. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but there's also another website set up selling shirts for £2 less than on yours. <laughs> 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 which, uh, oh. which, apparently, which apparently is a trade now. You can steal stuff from gigs and then then sell it somewhere else. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. really. That's Steve's other site. That's why he's not here. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he's fired. He's accused of stuff. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, Steve. Um, just to clarify, Steve, you're not fired. Don't cry. Oh. <laughs> I mean, that if could... you do want to pick up merch, our merch is delayeddepartureuk.bigcartel.co.uk. I think. That's what it is. I was going to say that's right. Yeah, right. We'll definitely we'll definitely send out the links with this so uh, so people can can find out more. We've got now tie dyes and acid wash by then. <laughs> wow. <laughs>
please. Are, are any of you wearing your shirts today? Let me have a look. Or, uh, <laughs> no, no. no. Um, I could probably no. go into the wardrobe and find one. Well, that would be a good plug, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that this video being used? Yeah, we, we use the video, so we're... Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's not> <laughs> oh, I, no. I didn't really want to mention anything. I thought it'd be quite funny, because whenever Ollie's speaking, it's sometimes got his hand there, or he's just... Yeah. He's, we can see up in the... Wall, up, I don't know. We can see out of the house somewhere. Oh, I'm, in, I'm in my garage at the moment. I'm in the garage. I thought, I thought I'd get away from it all and try and be in the quiet, but I've chosen them. It's not a good background for it. <laughs> and and I, just thought, I, I just thought that would be an endearing part of the, of the video. <laughs> uh, Ollie lives uh, in their garage. Yeah, I would. I, I, yeah, I could. I could live in my garage. I'd be alright. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and I don't. I don't think Mike made his bed behind him. Either. I didn't make my bed. No, no. <laughs> that's the. That's, that's the. If you follow any motivational videos, they said the first thing you have to do in life is get up and make, make your bed. Make your bed. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even do that. <laughs> Setting yourself up for failure now. I don't the only one I could find was our your colours one in my wardrobe. Oh right. It's like a, a lovely lady on the back saying your colours have gone. Wow. How, how, do you, how do you get these designed? Who is, made that one? Is that it, is it, do you, do you work with someone cool. or is it something you do yourselves? Uh, I mean, so we kind of come up with concepts. Um, that design was based off our um, EP artwork. Um, that whole range was brought out to us by Make North. Yeah. He's uh, Dan Holub is the guy behind Make North. He's amazing. Literally yeah. loads of bands we know go to him. He kind of brings our ideas to life in like a band merchy way. It's all good. Um, yeah, our recent design, our Waves tee, which I was trying to find, but it's in the wash, um, <laughs> was done by Aaron Finch. He's also another amazing designer that we use. So you yeah. should go f- both check them both. I was out. I was looking at some of his work earlier today, and um, as, as and uh, yeah, it's, it's incredible some of his designs, mm-hmm. and it really comes yeah. out in some of your. So is, has he been working with you on some of your other artwork as well, um, or how, how, because your artwork is incredible. Right, so thank you. Whether on your YouTube or yourself, and that's obviously quite a deliberate thing to have that quality because it, it really, really brings it out. How, how, how do you go through that process? So our EP artwork previously has all been Make North, same with our merch. Um, the Haunting Me um, cover art is done by Make North, and then the Waves Tea is done by Aaron Finch. Um, so that's our first design from Aaron. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, it's all kind of a, you like to kind of chop and change things now and again, just to get a different perspective. Mm. Um, see like if it, you can entice new people with new designs and a new kind of look on things. Same with music at the end of the day, same with uh, changing producer and stuff like that. Um, you just change things up now and again to kind of get a new way of kind of looking at things. And I saw some of Aaron's designs and they were kind of like the idea of what I kind of wanted. Um, so then I kind of, I approached him and then he was all on board and then came back with a killer waves design. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. So, so, so thinking about your live shows and are there particularly, you guys have been, how long, obviously you've been friends for a long time, you've been playing for a long time. Um, is there any particular gigs that you remember and you think that was the one, that's when we really nailed it or that was really great. It sort of, what, what were those better gigs that you can remember over all these years? Dream State, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we played. Um, there's, there's yeah, a band that I'm sure people are um, very much aware of called Dream State. Um, they they won a bunch of Kerrang awards last year for best British newcomer. Um, they they've got a, a just brilliant sound. Um, very kind of. Um, I, I wouldn't quite know how to describe it. It's not pop punk. Um, it's, it's like raw post hardcore, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, and she, the the singer CJ, um, she very much lays herself bare in terms of you know, be that emotionally or um, psychologically on stage. She puts so much into her music. Um, I think that draws in a lot of people. Um, but uh, yeah, we got put on a, a, a lineup at a local show um, in Guildford with them. Um, and we were like, you know, kind of, oh, this is a really good gig for us. Um, 
And I think it was the first gig that we had where people were queuing outside the door to get in before <laughs> showtime. Like always before doors always even good look. Yeah. yeah, they would yeah. queue around the corner and we were like, oh, guys, like this is... It was all before gig. we it even was... went on stage and it was like, yeah. wow. Yeah. yeah um, and so all these people poured in and, you know, packed out the, the venue before we'd even got on stage and before we'd even ready to go. I think we were, were we first or second on? We were first on, yeah. First on, yeah. 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 So we, we were first on. We had to kind of set the tone. Um, and bear in mind, a lot of these people, they, they weren't here for us. They were here for, they were here for Dreambound. Uh, sorry, Dream State. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, they, they got into it. They were straight away. They were, you know, vibing with us in a sense. Um, and I think the, the atmosphere from then on was just something that, you know, I'd always like to kind of try and replicate in the next gig um, as and when that may be. But uh, yeah, that was, that was definitely the best one for me personally. Yeah, me too. I think, you'd have to agree. I think that's pretty unanimous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think the guys in Dream State were just really nice as well. Mm. Um, when, when we were packing down our stuff, they were there handing me and Kedge beers. So, um, you know, having a chat with them, they're, they're actually really nice, nice people. So that, that made it, a, again, a nicer experience all around. I mean, the weird thing about that gig is that we had seen Dream State and we, I think there's this like false impression that when, when you're in a band, you don't like kind of look up to other bands and think, oh my God, you know, like, are we actually going to be able to play with these guys? And I think we're all a bit, we were really excited to play with Dream State. It was like one of those turning points for us where we thought, oh my God, we've put, been put on a really big roster now. Yeah. Um, and it was that realization on that night that when we saw them play and perform and we thought oh my god we were just chatting to them only like a few minutes ago you know just backstage and they were being all cool and like and now they're being like serious and like for me it was like it, it kind of cemented why we do what we do mm. because you can be someone totally different outside of the band but as a band you can make people especially in the audience feel emotions they've never felt or ones that they want to feel um you can help people kind of release the sort of like pressures of everyday life mm. um and when i saw dream state I, I certainly thought exactly that i was i just forgot about everything that we were doing i even forgot you know that we were in a band i was like, <laughs> like you know like i felt like i was just the there yeah. yeah like i came as a fan and it was I mean, um, an honor to play we went and saw them again in London afterwards. Like, um, you know, they're, oh, they're yeah. probably the only, they're probably one of the oh, only yeah. bands that we've played with that I've actually gone out of my way to see again, <laughs> which, which sounds awful, but it's just because, you know, the bands that we play with are dotted up and down the country. You don't often get the chance to, um, but they were playing a show in London at Scala. Um, and, uh, just so happened we were in London that night and there was a rock night on. So we went along and saw them and it was, uh, it was weird. Um, you know, that, they're, they're up on this big stage and there was probably a good again a few hundred maybe i don't know what the capacity at scala is but it was you know was a lot and yeah. there was a you know there was a good few hundred people there and um you know we were playing on that same show what six months beforehand yeah um so you know there's it was it was a kind of um a glimmer of hope as well that you know They've come up through the ranks of British rock and, you know, got to where they are now pretty, pretty well. Um, maybe it's our turn in, in the future. Hmm. Well, while we're talking about um, venues, you, of course, played at the Joiners uh, in hmm. Southampton, which I think um, the Joiners in Southampton. So I think I think in, I think it got best small venue in 2013 by NME. Um, what, what was it like? When, when did you play there and what was that like? couple of years back weren't it yeah, yeah that was that uh, was uh we've had a couple there haven't we uh, sure just we the one or was it just the one i think it was yeah, just, just the one. one we've done the hobbit as well um yeah, i've seen i've seen bands there before and i loved it um yeah it's uh yeah i think i, think... I, I love playing that venue because it's like a rise stage and a lot of small venues you do play aren't stages mm. um yeah. and the good thing about it is not barriered either so like you can get proper close to people. Um, it's a, a bit of an odd shaped room. Like it's got a good kind of front bit and then that kind of that alley bit down the side by the mixing desk. Um, but it sounds great. 
Um, we never had a sound issue really when we were there. Who did we play issue. with? Was it Maven, Altered Sky? Yeah. Yeah. I think my, my only biggest regret is we didn't play that venue later on in our band. Yeah, career. yeah I think that was, yes. that was too early for us. Yeah. Um, to be playing a, a venue that essentially has you know quite a bit of prestige about it in terms of, a, you think of a venue in Southampton, um, you know, you're probably thinking of the joiners. Um, so, you know, when it came to us playing then, we were, we were still a bit green, um, so to speak. Um, could have done with a bit more practice, a few more years under our belt. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll go back there. I yeah. hope so anyway. That's, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So you felt, because this, this is a prestigious event, as, uh, venue, as you say. So is it just, was it just too early in your... I mean, why do you feel that? Because I'm sure people listening to you probably didn't feel like that at all. Um, but uh, why do you and why do you think that would have been better for you to have played there um, and and not 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 maybe played so early? Well, I think it was a jump. Yeah, I think yeah. it was only like a few years ago that I went with Charlie and we met Hands Like Houses, which is like one of our biggest inspirations for our band, and we saw them performing, and then it was almost what maybe like two years later we were then on that stage and i was like oh my god we've just seen like hands like houses who have like thousands of fans and we're here <laughs> we're actually performing um but i think as we've gone on as a band we've become increasingly better on the stage because it's like ev with everything the more you experience it the better you get mm -hmm. um like, weren't a bad show. We played great. We had loads of people. The bands came up to us. They loved what we were doing. I just think it. I think it's always good to keep criticising yourself because yeah. you can always grow and always become better at your like art form. So, like, if we went back there now, we know we would do a better set. We would get like more interaction and stuff like that. I think there is pipeline works of John. Trying to trying to get us back there. Trying to get us back there. Yeah, I think we were due to. But how how is your sound over this time then? Because you, like you said, the more you practice, the more you do something, you absolutely can get better. But you could, of course have got to put in the hard yards and put in the hours over the years. How's your sound? How's your band evolved from? If you think about some of your first songs you're releasing, so you're going to Spotify were 2016 or so, I think, and then maybe 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 some before that, which I think you 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 admitted you took them took them off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so and then 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 that's what's that journey for, like to, to to where you are today and how that sound has evolved. I think it's the production side of things. So when we started as a band, it was very raw and it was very much like what we played was what you hear. And I think there's a kind of like people don't realize how much goes into a live set nowadays. Like you have a click track to keep you all in time, like in your ears. Um, Steve has that. So he, we know he's going to be tight as anything and there's no doubt about it. Like he's going to fall out cause he won't. He's a great drummer as well. Not to say that he's not bad. Um, yeah. But, um, I, th I think the so, second half of this, this show needs to be talking nice things about Steve. <laughs> <laughs> because Amazing, I, he has great even, haircuts. <laughs> I don't even know the poor guy and we've fired him, we've coated him off a lot and I, th I think we should probably say some nice things about him. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so yeah, so originally when you're starting as a band, like what is on CD is very different from live. Like there's a lot of layers that are generally missed when you're a startup band. So now we have like backing tracks, which kind of have our synth, the layers to kind of build more production. Uh, pro uh, sorry about that. Production. Uh, you have like kind of interlude tracks between songs. So there's not just dead silence and stuff. So like maybe a bit of keys or something, uh, a bit of reverb chain still flowing to keep the atmosphere still going because nothing's worse than ending a song. No music's there. And then like, everyone's yeah. cheered and then it just goes quiet and you're just like, okay. We should have started this song maybe three <laughs> seconds ago. Yeah. It's like yeah. things you learn as you progress, like um, with more performing. Like yeah. there's a lot of things that a lot of people don't realise go into live shows, especially with your favourite artists, like the production side, the lighting, um, with some like people like is mad. So where we are now, we've got the backing tracks, we've got the more presence, we've structured our like we don't play our EPs as they are on the CD we st we structure our songs of kind of kind of like a roller coaster of how we want you to feel and like go through our live set 
um, we might be like, right, that's a really hard hitting song. Let's calm things down a little bit. Let's play this one, trying to get people to relax a bit. And then you always end on a banger. I think in terms of other songs that we've written previously, and as you, as you mentioned, may, may well have taken down as well, um, they sounded great at the time, as far as we were concerned. Um, you know, we recorded them, we put them out, we, you know, enjoyed sharing them amongst our friends and stuff. And then it came to a point, you know, several months, you know, maybe a year or so down the line where we recorded new stuff. And you kind of look back on the stuff that you put, put out previously and then there's a, there's a definite divide. You, you, you listen to the new stuff and you think, yeah, this sounds great. And you listen to the old stuff and you're like, why do we release that? <laughs> <laughs> this, <laughs> this is, <laughs> that's not our sound. And so, you know, as much as our sound um, changes and develops, that's where the kind of um, the self-critical element comes into it because you can kind of see through the years how we've progressed into our current sound um and you know looking back on some of our other stuff um i wouldn't release it nowadays <laughs> yeah um and so you kind of the excitement of oh this is a song this is what we made get it out there as quickly as possible comes to a point of <laughs> right how can we get this as polished as we can how can we get it to the best sound that we want and then release it and then share it with our friends um so getting rid of that excitability, that excited puppy element of us once we've just released it, just recorded a song and then going back to it and being self-critical of it, I think is something that we've done a bit more recently. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll record a song and we'll have it in our um, library, I guess, for a couple of months before we'll actually go and release the song. And in that time, you listen to it and 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 you pick out tiny flaws, fix them, and then you're happy to release it. Um, so I think that's something that's changed with us over the years as well. And then do you have you... to hold back for PR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And do, do you find when you get, when you've refined and refined and refined those tracks, that you all agree and go, right, this is the time for it all to go out? Or is it, can there still be some mixed views or some people going, actually, I still want to tighten up these little bits? Because what's come across from, from chatting with you today is that, you know, you're, clearly good guys incredibly humble around around what it is that you do but also self-critical and and you've i guess you've got to be to keep on evolving your sound and keep on maturing and making it better and and then i suppose the question is do you all agree on what good looks like as as no. you're about to release something no. so sometimes well, with every we have <laughs> agreements um but i think with all of us we kind of strive for perfection if it doesn't sound perfect there's then you know there's no there's point, no point in releasing it there's no point in releasing it exactly so <laughs> if, if say we, we have a take that isn't tight enough um i think that that's unanimous with all of us if the take isn't good enough everyone knows and everyone will say that you need to redo that and it's yeah. not it's not down to criticizing that person it's down to saying this like everyone knows this this is for the best of the this is for the good of the band but um we do have a lot of disagreements when it comes to writing music obviously everyone's got different influences um but we sort of always arrive at a compromise that suits everybody exactly it's what it's what we're it's what we're good at we're comp we're compromisers so i think we all have the same goal at the end yeah, of the yeah, yeah, exactly. different ways of getting there but yeah. like we all want the same thing yeah. we all want our music to be good and relatable i think yeah. you have to have an element of disagreement between people to find the mm -hmm. the, the middle ground and yeah um it, it means that you're still all invested in it um you know you still want um, the, the best sound that you can get and whether that be the best sound that you want or the, you know, kind of the, the, the stylistic qualities that you want within a song. Um, you know, they may not be what you want, but then, you, you, you know, for me, for example, there was, there was a song previously where I thought, ah, oh, no, it's not, it's not what I want. But at the same time, the, I, knew, I knew the rest of the guys wanted it. And so you kind of have to, at that time, take a step back and go, right, okay, well, it may not be what I want stylistically, but is it good enough um, in, an, in an auditory sense? And that's when the compromising comes in. You drop any kind of you know, issue that you have with the song aside and then work on it to get it as good as it can be. Um, and that's where that compromise comes in. Um, and I think that's what we're, we're good at as a band. We get through it. Mm. There is definitely a stage though, when coming back to the revisions where you're just picking things at it now. And there is a line where you're just like, right, this is done. It's going out, yeah. Because um, otherwise, you might be like, 
there's a random like breath here and it really yeah. annoys me um, it's like does it detract from the song <laughs> no okay it's fine believe it yeah there's, uh, there's a... definitely some things we can pick out in some of our tracks which we won't say because you'll never want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah we don't, we don't so want to draw attention to them <laughs> but it's like you can be super destructive as well there's like a fine line between being like hypercritical and then picking things out and actually you can find that sometimes it can have a detrimental effect. You might have something that's really nice and raw, like maybe there's a vocal that's not quite tuned perfectly. And you know, it, it's got it's got like a bit of edginess to it though, and a bit of emotion. If you just put that through a pitch corrector because it needs to be perfect, you lose the feeling of yeah. what the it takes the emotion about. out of it. So realistically, I don't think we ever strive for things to be manufactured. Um, I think one thing that we've always been told is that when you listen to our records, um, that live we sound the same, if not actually sometimes better. <laughs> so we we don't have energy that comes with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's what we've been trying to get into our newer things, newer songs, newer ideas. We want energy and um, like a driving performance. Certainly. We want the studio to match exactly what we do live because the energy that you feel live is always, well, actually in most cases, it's going to be better than what you can ever hear reproduced in the studio just because of the atmospherics, as Ollie said. You, you talked a lot about unity at the very beginning, mm -hmm. um, but also then there's got to be, you, know, you talk about being self-critical mm -hmm. and, and making sure that, you know, you're all challenging each other in some respects. Um, well, so, so, and, 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 that, and I think that unity comes back to the fact that you're, you know, you're all friends at the very beginning and you're allowed to then have those types of conversations. Mm -hmm. like, you know, sometimes when you look at other bands, maybe if they don't have that base friendship, that's, and that's where it can be quite, um, difficult for them maybe if you think about the long term because i mean what's the lifespan of a band um because you guys have been together for a long time now um and but maybe that's because you've got the foundations of being friends mm -hmm. um but yet you've been able to maintain this healthy unity and balance and sort of challenge each other um yeah so it's it's really interesting to see kind of that that journey that you've been on um and I suppose, I suppose, where where next do you go from here? Obviously, we get out of lockdown. Hopefully, we can we can get out and we can we can start going to venues and everything again. What's the what's the future? I guess get, <laughs> get back into the studio, get yeah. some new tracks done. We've got some demos at the moment, so see if they come to light and how we kind of progress with them. Um, as and when we're allowed to start gigging again, um, get something like penciled in. Um, I know I really want to go back to playing shows. <laughs> Big time. Mm. Yeah, it's sad. <laughs> we need another tour. Definitely another tour. How, how, many, how many shows were you doing like a year or a month or so before, before lockdown? Um, so we kind of used to do like, was it like every other month or something? Mm. Yeah. Um, unless we did like a, a run of shows, like a weekend of like four days or something. But like averagely we do like one every other month because you don't want to be playing every week. Um, like people won't want to come see you. There is kind of a thing of you don't want to be seen too often to make no one actually come. We'd I'd rather mm. I'd rather play like five good shows a year than fifty bland shows that not many people come to. Mm. Um, I think that's where it kind of comes from. Uh, I think there's a there's there's a there's an element of um, time that we spend writing as well um we'll kind of go off the boil with gigs um so if we've got you know a new ep that we're said right let's do a five track ep um and all our practicing then is essentially writing time and um, so our, our weekly practices that we have um you know we'll run through our set list that we have and then we'll put a lot of effort into practicing and so um the the, the gigging aspect of that kind of takes a, a back seat in terms of trying to get new stuff that then you can then put into your new shows. Um, so yeah, I think that um, that definitely has an effect on how many gigs we play a year as well. Mm. So it sounds, 
sounds like you need to make a conscious decision. Do you have to make a conscious decision on, yes, we want to play that venue or you know what, that doesn't quite fit with us at this point. And do you, do you have, do you have that where you've got to sort of make those decisions as a band? It's very yeah. bipolar between the performing side and the writing side. Um, we've had a few instances where we've had a gig in the middle of like a writing period. And then we've had to like rush and be like, right, we can't be writing here now. We need to get in this many practices before a show because we're going to be rusty um, yeah. so coming out of a writing period. That's yeah, interesting. there's been a couple of last, last minute shows as well that have been dropped on us and said, hey, do you want to play this show now? Like uh, this weekend. And we've had to kind of turn around and say, we're not, we're not ready for that. But we've, not, we've not been practicing for a week or two. We've been writing some stuff. So I, I don't think it's the right choice for us to go and play that show now. Um, there's been a couple that we have played and, you know, have gone all right, I think. But um, that's, that's interesting because a lot of what's come across today is about structure right so you, you're and you're talking about structuring your time to say right this is now a writing period or this is now we're going to do, do gigs and we have to plan for that particular gig that we're doing when you're going for a writing period like how long does that how long is that that time and, and how do you make that decision as a band of you know the next week or two weeks or month or whatever we're going to really focus on getting some stuff down well it's not it's not necessarily sort of we don't necessarily have sort of the year split up we don't have the cal don't have it on the calendar but say um, we just come off the back of playing a few shows um, and it's sort, sort of getting towards the time where we want to push for a new release. Well then if, if or if we have an idea, or if we jump an idea in, in practice or someone writes an idea, then we'll work on that until I guess until it's finished or until we're at a period where we're happy with it. And then, then we'll go back to playing shows once we've, once we feel like we've written all that we can write. And, then, and are you getting together before lockdown? Were you getting together? You're practicing regularly. I think you're all you're local, and you're all from all, all from the Farnborough. Well, except, for Mike. <laughs> except for Mike. <laughs> Mike lives up north in Harrogate. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, that's a long way north, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. But you know, we still we still. I think this is the amazing thing about something like this as well, that no matter where we are, we can still communicate, and with the writing, even if I'm up here we can still do something similar to this and we can still mm -hmm. track things and we can still have, you know, powers of the internet, you know, we can send ideas back and forth. Um, whereas I, I, you know, I'd hate to be what maybe like 40 years ago where possibly you'd, you'd all have to be in a room and you'd all have to have very limited equipment. And we're in, we're in like a, the modern ages where I, I feel like you can be even more creative than, you know any musician has ever been able to be so but with when it comes to like gigs and stuff usually the guys are all um, they practice religiously week on week um if not every two weeks perhaps and then i will come down for a run of a few days to just warm my voice up again get myself back into it and then we hit the shows yeah um, we'll, do, we'll do like if, if there's a big show coming up we'll do um three practices in the week previous to it as well so you know we get we get one practice in just to find our feet again after the last week's practice find our feet with mike and then two practices just to nail down everything if there's any changes that we need to make last minute changes um get that down and then we'll play the show as well so you know, it very much depends on the the gig roster as to how much we're practicing i guess yeah and when you're going through that have you decided, right, you've got a gig coming up in a few weeks of time, have you decided what your set's going to be prior to that and said, right, we're going to, we're going to practice this set? Or is it something that you have to agree on the night and go, right, the crowd are like this, this is how we're going to play? How does, how does that work? Generally pre-agreed. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. Um, we, we've kind of found a format with our songs that works for kind of, as, as Charlie mentioned earlier, we kind of want to put people through um, uh, a bit of a journey on our shows um, in terms of just, just the, the, the tempo, the dynamics and the, the kind of rhythm of the shows, you know, you want to almost start, you can either start it slow and ramp it up and make it big and then come down again and then finish on a high, or you can, you know, start big, bring it in low and then finish on a high again. So that's, that's something that we, you know, predetermine for every gig. We'll, we'll have a, we'll have a lineup sort of, it might, 
change and vary slightly from gig to gig, but I think we've found a, a kind of working format that we like at the moment. Well, and what, what, what is that for? Because all the, all the sort of, you know, if you, whatever type of music you go and listen to, it's always great when the band or, you know, the DJ or whatever is conscious of that and they do take you on a journey. You know, the, the best, best gigs I've always been to is that because it's, it's not just a physical, you're there and enjoying it. It's an emotional connection to the band and the music at that time. So what, what's the journey that you like? You, you, is, is there a preference on the journey that you'd like to go through with your, with, with your, your, with your live acts? So we open at the moment with a song called Your Colours, which is quite hard hitting to start, but kind of like drops down to the kind of very distancy emotive kind of intimate ending. Um, so it kind of just that kind of that song there kind of gives people a taste of what is to come. Um, and then we kind of fluctuate between our kind of heavier to more poppy songs. And then what song do we finish on? Uh, let's catch fire. Right. Yeah, let's catch fire. So, oh, Pop Punky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, everyone, it's got gang vocals. Everyone's kind of warmed up. And because most people at a gig, they've, if, especially if you're, like, you're not like there for the first band, just, you're not going to want to move, get involved a bit. So, the first two songs, you need to like hit hard and get people kind of like knowing that, right, you can do what you want. You can bob along, you can sing along, like, get involved like it's just about having a good time um where if you kind of start on a low i kind of think it's kind of hard to bring people up gradually like mm. i like to hit them hard go soft and then hit them hard again so then by the time the second time around they're like yeah go for it <laughs> so, <laughs> probably should have thought about how you phrase that to be honest yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, was... I don't hit people <laughs> <laughs> Right, I just said, but like, so what, what's the track that you like to start with? So if I'm going to go listen to your bits, your stuff now, like where, which, which track is it that you like to start with? Your Colours. Your, your Colours, yeah. yeah. Ah, got it, right. has a nice intro track that we have made specifically for live as well. Okay, that's number track five on the album on, uh, on Spotify. It is, yeah. It is, yeah. 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 Okay. And that's, that's kind of what we mean when we say that, you know, we, what we do on the album and stuff will, will take you on a, a very different journey to what our live shows would be. Um, you know, for the album, it may be that you start off slow and then build the album to a, a you know, a massive crescendo at the end of it. Um, whereas in our shows, we very much differ from that and we take a very different route because we've got other songs from other EPs and whatnot that we can throw in the mix. We can take, we can, you know, take whatever route we please in that sense. Um, and whatever suits um, the the kind of show in that in that respect. Um, it's different audience, isn't it? Different listeners. Mm. Like when you put yeah. on a, well, I don't know. If you're old fashioned like me, sometimes I like to actually put on a CD and listen to an <laughs> album through <laughs> instead yeah. of just pick off singles. Exactly. When you're doing that, you're making a conscious decision to stay and listen to the whole album. So you're already ready to kind of like go on that journey. If you're listening to single after single after single, most of the times you're doing it just because, oh, I like this song. I might as well put this one on. You may put one that's like a completely different genre on. Um, so you're doing it just kind of for like maybe background noise or maybe just because you like it. But live, I feel like you, again, make a conscious decision to come to something live because you want to be taken on the journey, realistically. You may be there for your friends, but, you know, the favorable thing for people is I want this to be an amazing live show. And the only way it's ever an amazing live show is if it connects to you emotionally. Mm. Um, so we basically set up everything to make our audience <laughs> impact them in the same way that we want them. You know, we basically try to tailor what we want them to feel throughout the mm. performance um, manipulate them yeah, yes <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it depends on who we play with Hang on. Yeah, you've been you've been, hit, you've been hitting your crowd and you've been manipulating them manipulating. Yeah. <laughs> God. we are the epitome of a bad relationship yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've sat <sucked> cage <laughs> oh. yeah mm. it's, it's it's really interesting talking to you about about this so something i've noticed is that certainly with you know with everything going digital, you know, obviously I listen to a lot of music over Spotify, so does everyone else, etc. But my favourite thing years ago was always getting an album and listening to it properly. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously you can buy it on CD or, or whatever years ago. And I do think now with everything going digital, it, it's changed because you just go listen to Spotify and listen to, you know, your playlist or whatever. And they are just a collection of songs. And of course you structure those songs possibly in a way that makes you feel good or your favorite songs, or whatever. But I do think we, if you don't listen to an album the way that it was intended by the band, you know, I think back to my favorite album is probably definitely maybe, which is probably a cliche. Everyone likes that, but, but it, it was done. It was created in a certain way. I think yeah. quite deliberately that's, you know, you start off a rock and roll star, then it goes into everything else. And um, that's quite deliberate. Yeah. yeah. I, I do think we, you know, we, we, we potentially lose that when you release an album because people don't always listen to it in order. They, one of the buttons I press all the time is shuffle because shuffle. you don't want to listen to it in order, but they, I think people are lose, missing out slightly. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think I would, I would very much agree with that. My, one of my all time favorite albums is um, the vision bell by Pink Floyd. And that very much is uh, a, well, it's a journey of an album. You, um, you listen to it front to back. Uh, it's it's like it's so um, dynamically different throughout the entire album. Or well, any Pink Floyd album, I guess, is is very much a journey in in my eyes, and it's something that I will listen to from front to back. I, I won't. I will never hit shuffle on a Floyd album, or Hybrid Theory from Linkin Park, or Take This Guys from Shikari because those albums you can tell um, in the way they're put together are meant to be listened from front to back. And I, like you say, I, th I think that's something we certainly um, lost over the years. Um, as soon as you develop the ability to skip a track or shuffle a CD or, um, you know, as you say, come to Spotify and then just pick the tracks that you want and you like, you lose that storytelling um, roller coaster ride of an album that you used to have, mm. um, which is a shame, but I guess that's, the way things go people want I, yeah I, I, f I first noticed that years ago when because I, I really love faithless as you know it's a, a band dj act etc yeah and i when i was listening to retrospective and outrospective and i was like oh, i was quite young then but 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 i was always thinking i left listening to that album because i listened to it in sequence in a feeling in a different state because yeah. they did have Obviously, they're known for dance music, but of course, they would have some very quiet tracks, some more emotional tracks. Then you'd have your uplifting moments. Then you'd have an emotional moment. And then actually, you left going, oh, this is a bit of therapy. Yeah. Um, you, you felt good at the end because of the journey that you'd been on. But it wasn't all yeah. hard or wasn't all quiet. It was, it was you know, it gave, gave a certain feeling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that's something that we strive for in our music. Um, we want to make emotive music. I think too much maybe maybe in the mainstream charts possibly that there's a lot of music that kind of gets a bit diluted because it's all about very much the same sort of topics for us we co we cover such a like a, a broad spectrum of topics and it's realistically just what we feel at the time of lyric writing um and when we you know record songs and we make songs and we release them on spotify we favorably would love people to listen to our EPs start to finish. Um, mm -hmm. But if there is a way, you know, where they want to listen to songs in a different order or something, I feel like another really good take on things is that lyrically as well, it can mean different things to different people, which is why when it comes to the meaning of our songs, sometimes it's quite loose. You know, I may have written about some experience, but if it relates to somebody else in a different experience, that's that's amazing. That's exactly what we want. Um, basically, we want it to be as relatable to everybody as possible. Um, and I think that's somewhat what's lost in sort of like mainstream music. Some of that emotive feeling that you get, because uh, you know, I don't I don't feel too emotive about like. <laughs> you know, driving my car around and, <laughs> I don't know, partying Cardi all the time and stuff. You know? Cardi B and Cardi B. <laughs> all, all these lot just, they're, 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 they've lost their kind of emotion behind music and now they're just churning out music to appease the fans, which is fair enough. That's, that's what they're there for. They are, um, you know, creating music that is just music for the sake of music in my eyes. Eh? Um, you know, there's no, no real story that you know with with our music we try and relate it to our experiences with music um like grime and stuff so you know that's very much related to their 
their experiences as um, you know youths and then come up into the grind ranks and then they, they rap about their past and history or their present even um, in a lot of respects. Um, but a lot of you know charting pop music at the moment is just there's not much substance to it in, in my opinion. Um, I, I wish there were more. Um, you know I wish you could you could hear about people's lives, but unfortunately all you hear about is the the dress that they're wearing, the shoes that they're wearing, the car that they're driving, the money that they're earning. And it kind of takes takes a lot of the the emotion out of music. Which is yeah. the fa- it's just the foundation, which is why we all fall in love with music in exactly. the first place. Exactly. You exactly. do find then it ends up with a commercial point to it. Mm. That's, God, I haven't listened to commercial music for a really long time now, but it's and that's the funny thing is years ago before before the internet that's why it's transformed things so much because of course bands like yourselves can get your music out yet out there you don't have to wait to be signed or you don't have to wait you can just go right we're going to put together some tracks digitally we can get them out there um what where where are you getting your music out where where can we go and consume and listen and enjoy it Uh, spotify uh, apple music any pretty much any streaming platform you can think of will be on there um, YouTube, if you want to watch, I know a lot of people like to watch music videos as well. We've got a few of those on YouTube. Mm. Um, and I think the handle on all of them is just, it's literally just Delayed Departure, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, no yeah. Or Delayed Departure Band, potentially. Or, or, well. Yeah, or Delayed Departure UK. Any variation, you, you'll, if you type Delayed Departure. Type is in, like, yeah. if you type in Delayed Departure Band, I think we come up. With, yeah. I think, yeah. I think we're probably the only band with that name. Yeah, <laughs> there is an Irish band, I think, somewhere. There's <laughs> an Irish duo. I was, when, I was um, trying to, when I was trying to tag you in a post last night, it kept on coming up. I'm sure it's something late related to BA or something. It's <laughs> delayed departure. And I was like, this is definitely not right. <laughs> hey, if it brings in a crowd, we'll take it. <laughs> I can imagine there's a lot of people missing people flights. People tag us on the wrong pictures on Instagram. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we've had a couple of that. Where, where do you take your inspirations from musically? Like, what other bands, like, more locally to you, do you look up to and think they're great? Or, you know, or some of the bigger bands that, that are well-known? Where, where do you look to for inspiration? It's all different between each of us. I mean, um, we, we do draw um, a broad range of influence from, from everywhere. Um, personally, uh, growing up, my dad listened to, to a lot of, like your Pink Floyds and your Journey and bands like that. So I, I have such a, such a sort of soft spot for bands like that. Um, but then now, uh, and anything, literally, my Spotify is like uh, an absolute <laughs> mess. It's unbelievable. They're the sort of, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, no, there's so there's so much. I, c- I couldn't really pin it down to to one specific band or one specific style personally. We're quite people, eclectic, I think. Yeah. Like, yeah. We people like kind of want to hear what we listen to. Um, yeah. We do have a playlist on our Spotify that we kind of curate every two weeks of tracks that we're listening to at the moment. Um, yeah. They are very rocky, though, I think. Let's talk that through, because that's interesting. Because I was, I was looking at this. It's called Departure Lounge. Yeah. Um, uh, lockdown edition. So, so we've got Low. Um, who's 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 preferred? Whose song is that? That's by Wage War, and that's from that was, Pressure. Uh, that that's was me. Oh, yeah. uh, that was my one. Yeah. So so they're kind of like a metalcore band. Um, I think they're Australian. Uh, I might it. be wrong. They're very good. Yeah. yeah they're like a metalcore band. So that's one sort of where we, we sort of take a lot from the metalcore genre, but more the more sort of melodic parts, the less less sort of screaming thrashy track. part yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we soften it down a lot yeah. <laughs> we have breakdowns but we're not brutal yeah. <laughs> yeah and next you've got gravity from souvenirs uh from novelist yes from novelist yes, yes. yeah um that was a track that me and mike listened to yeah um, they're, I, they're french i think um, so. they're, they're super technical they're like unreal uh, they're kind brilliant. of more of a techie style of guitar that I kind of mm-hmm. like listening to. Um, makes me want to play better, I guess. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we get you, some you, more you, pop punky you, vibes. You've got Haunting Me, you've got your own track on there as well. Of course, yeah. <laughs> <we've> got, <laughs> shameless. Got shameless. Shameless. Guess, shameless. Self-promotion. Uh, Self-promotion, yeah. There's, there's a great one here called Drink About It by Issues. Yeah. Absolutely. They're unreal. 
like they're Great quite song. brilliant band. mainstream like r&b style vocals with like chugs and stuff yeah proper groovy kind of sad and metalcore i say yeah and you got cocky He's oh, just cocky. Yeah. Tillian. 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 Tillian, yeah. He's, just, he's, 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 he's the Jamie, singer it? of Dance Kevin Dance. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Those songs. Cool. Yeah, they come under like a time. nice kind of funky bracket of the alternative style scene. Yeah. It's, it's not as heavy as the, the rest of them. It's just nice gliding vocals and yeah. it's kind of something that vocals. we do, I think. Yeah. He's got a great voice. He's yeah, he does. Yeah, he really does. Which is Flower. Um, got that on there. You've got Heavy Breathing. Uh, neon Lights, another one of yours. Well done. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one, one on here, which I, it, I don't even know how to pronounce it. By, is it Shezzers? Um, oh, oh uh, Emoji Queen. Emoji Queen by Shezzers. <laughs> Brilliant <laughs> Honestly, song. if you want to listen Absolutely. to a song that has everything, I mean, it's got screaming, it's got it rap, it's got a saxophone solo, solo <laughs> um, like amazing R&B style vocals. Um, it's literally got everything. So That kind of describes the band, really. <laughs> like, um, that song's like just a combination of everything and it's probably why we like it. <laughs> it's, it's unreal. Yeah, it is. I think there's probably certain elements of our interests in music that have probably been held back from that as well um just because you know people who listen to our music um may not necessarily like to some of the music you know may not necessarily like some of the music we listen to um so you know i know myself and jamie um you know we dabble in a bit of grime every now and again um and i don't think that features quite heavily on our on our playlist at all um they get you rapping ollie uh, that's, that happens when the drinks are flowing and when the drinks are flowing only. Um, <laughs> but um, I think I think there's 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 a fair bit that we've potentially not intentionally missed off. But you know there there are other genres, other artists on there that um, you know I think we might add on in the coming days. Um, I mean we've got people like Billie Eilish on there. Yeah, love her, love her. She's brilliant. That's that's exactly it. Like that's real slow pop mainstream music, but like ah, but it's that motion that we spoke about earlier that she brings to the table. Um, she's a bit different than a lot of other artists, isn't she? Yeah, she she it's like she sings from a place that no one else is doing at the moment, and she's yeah. got an incredible voice. Mm. And her brother, I think, what's his name, Phineas or something? Phineas. Yeah, Phineas. Yeah, incredible musician. And yeah. producer, and the the, the combination that what they put out, like, is you know, I can see why she's become as massive as she is because just the talent there is phenomenal. Yeah, definitely. When there's you talk really highly, and you have, sounds like you have a lot of respect for for um, for the singer you're just mentioning. Is there any uh, ever think about right? Maybe this is an opportunity to collaborate. Is that something? I know. I know there was a, uh, one of your songs that you did have uh, a collaboration with, didn't you? Just yeah, 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 yeah. with Russ Mary. Yeah. So, so is that something that that you think about as a band? To say, actually, you know, we can collaborate and you know, give us a different approach or a different sound, different audience in some ways. Yeah. So, Russ Russ Mary was not on Ocean. Absolutely. Yeah. I think for us, it's for us when we want to collaborate with somebody, it's never on like really notoriety like we don't it's not you know it's not a big issue maybe they don't come with a great reputation they don't they're not that popular in a band maybe i don't know but if we know that they have a brilliant voice or if they have like something that will really lend musically to our music and might make it better or enhance it that's definitely what we always kind of go for um and russ was somebody who we knew really well we played with his uh, former band Street Fighter Silence quite a lot. Um, he actually did some production on some of the earlier stuff that we did. So we had that sort of trust and we knew he was a brilliant singer. So it was um, complimentary to my voice as well, his voice, because we're quite different. So I think when we're looking to collab, it's like, it's what would be within the best interests of the music rather than you know, are they a big name, for example? Yeah, status really doesn't come into it. It's more about the the, the talent and the attitude, I guess, as well. Um, I wouldn't want to collaborate with someone who was just a bit of a mm, Johnny Craig. Um, 
he, he, he would be an exception to the rule, I would say. But, you know, someone who's not got the attitude to, you know, enjoy the recording, enjoy being part of this, the, the um, kind of process. Um, so I think that's something that would certainly come into play um, as well, is mm. the talent and the attitude. And whether we know them personally or not, um, I think maybe plays a feature as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we know them personally, we, we know what they like to deal with. We enjoy their company. That Then probably, if they're a good musician, would be interested. <laughs> but that's, that's actually coming back to the core roots of your band, which is unity of your friends. And you want to play and make music with people that you like and get on with. So therefore, one, you can get a great track created but also you want to enjoy the process in this on the, on the same way that's yeah. in that's what's great about about kind of where you are at your stage because like you were just saying if we go back to the charts and the things we're listening to a lot of big artists will collaborate with other big artists because they know they will get the publicity mm. um and i i always find that incredibly see-through i listen to it and think what does it mean what's it about it's probably just about making a track for some money but actually yeah. i think think people gravitate to bands more when you know you're in it for the right reasons and you know you're you're playing with your friends and you you you, you know you, if you are going to collaborate then it's all for the right reasons yeah absolutely mm, it's interesting yeah. now you, you have recently had a a track i think you had a track played on radio one didn't you so on, on bbc introducing we did, we did yeah. yeah that must have been really good to head so when, when did that go out that was uh, Ocean, wasn't it? Yeah, Ocean, the reimagined re version. version. It was uh, Wednesday night, I believe. Wednesday night, that yeah. How did that, yeah, how did that come uh, around? How did that come? Did they reach out to you or how did that happen? Uh, so I um, have contact with uh, Melita on the South Show and we upload our tracks to the BBC Introducing, like as a lot of people do. And we've been quite fortunate that I think we've had about four tracks now played mm -hmm. quite a few tracks on, played on, on the there, shows yeah. over the years so um yeah it's all, all pretty good mm. how do you choose which track you're gonna or do they choose or how does that happen do, do they say actually you said this is the track i really we want to get out there or they, they just select one for the shows how does it work i think so they've got a decision upload, board haven't they yeah, yeah so you know, like someone listens tracks. to it and then you get pushed forward if they like that track and then they've kind of put it into a suitable show i think yeah mm. i think there, there's there's uh i think for each um show i think there's um a, a group of four or five people who um will, will at the beginning of the week get given a list of you know x amount of songs that have been uploaded and then they obviously kind of go through them and listen to the ones that are potentially viable for um certain shows and then put them forward for that um mm -hmm. and as, as as Charlie mentioned, I think Melita has been you know, very good to us in that she will, um, you know, she will entertain us quite quite willingly by the by the feel of it at least, um, uh, which is which is always positive. Um, and uh, you know, as much as we've we've got other songs that are on there that haven't get played, you know, the songs that we've got played on there, um, I think are. Our, um, do you do you find that makes a big difference getting played on those types of platforms do you know do you do you notice a, a difference you know when, when you then go and play the next gig you know there's more people there or people recognize your songs more or or maybe um you know suddenly you've, you, you notice a bit of a spike on spotify does, does that actually give you a good platform um i think i think so i mean uh, i've i've definitely um because we will kind of do a bit of self-promotion in the run-up to it because you know we'll get notified saying oh we're going to play your song at this time on that on that radio show and um you know people who wouldn't necessarily um tune into the radio at any given time um may well tune in and listen to the song and it, it you know it might be people who are you know ardent listeners of our music or it could just be someone who thought oh yeah that is is that that's an iPlayer? I can just pop that on um, and listen to it while I'm going about my day. And then, yeah. you know, you'll get a message out of the blue from someone. Oh, I just listened to your track on BBC Introducing. Sounds great. And you know that, that there there is a it is does give you a a little confidence boost in that respect. Um, but I mean, in terms of um, whether people 
come to the show because of it, um, I, I wouldn't be able to say. I mean, it would be great if people did, but um, I think at this point, um, you know, shows are kind of a, they're just on the back burner for now. But uh, yeah, of course. If, 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 if you did listen to it on the radio, do come to our show. It'd be nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a few videos up on, on, on YouTube as well. Um, talk me through, through the, the haunting, haunting me. It's a really interesting video. So, uh, so how, how did that all come around? So it's filmed by Ollie Duncanson. Um, he's an amazing filmographer. Um, the concepts of the narrative were kind of designed by me. Um, Mike's topic of the song is very much paranoia. Yeah, um, exactly. So I was trying to work out ways of trying to show people like how it could feel as such. Um, mm. I guess I'm quite creative. Um, so <laughs> the narrative sides of it are the smashed mirror of looking into it and seeing different visions of yourself. Um, there's a scene where I've got my head in a fish tank uh, screaming, um, which could obviously be quite a suffocating feeling regarding the paranoia. Um, there's one scene where I'm getting rubbed all over with black gloves across my face by the guys. Um, that was specifically the thing I wanted to talk about, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that was probably the strangest scene to film because... It's pretty hard to watch it as well, I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably like an hour long we did that bit for between setting up mm. and whatever. And I just remember sitting on this chair in this basement in London, because that's where we filmed it blindfolded just sat there with the guys sometimes not even speaking just walking around and then now and again you just hear going cool we're gonna do a take and then just getting grabbed and i was just like this is actually like the strangest part of this video uh -huh. well i think the... that's that's probably the aim of it uh, exactly. at, the, at the end of the day is that you know this this whole anxiety and, and mental health can just come out of nowhere and just grab you by the face and, and run with you um yeah. I think that's that if, if that's if that's come across and if that's come across in the video, then I'm perfect. That's exactly what we wanted. We wanted um, to evoke those feelings, didn't we? Realistically, mm. we wanted people to relate to it. Not not to obviously trigger people that are having anxieties or anything like that, but more to say, well, look, we, we experience it as well. It's normal. Yeah. You know, there's more people that experience this than don't. And you know, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, then it helps you relate somewhat to what people with anxiety do feel, or yeah. as much as we can personally, you know, bring to the try it. Yeah. I think being a group of guys as well is kind of one of the good things about it as well, because guys generally don't like dealing with subjects with anxiety and stuff like that. And it kind of just shows that it does happen and it is relatable definitely mm. Mm. it's good i mean definitely you can well, and i've mentioned about the next one as well which is breathe breathe it in um which is also here and that's also sort of talking about some of the challenges challenges that we have whether it's alcohol or or, or, um, or drugs etc and of course this is sort of tackling anxiety is that quite a deliberate thing to sort of tackle you tackle some of these bigger you know very global issues and but try try and make it more relatable as part of the music and part of the videos I think so. Oh, I yeah. think it's what we, so. the music certainly um, attempts it. And then we, I think the thing with all our music videos is we always try to cater it towards what the music is saying. Um, it would make no sense to have a music video that just didn't in any way relate to the lyrics, for example, because <laughs> it would be, you know, confusing to say the least. Um, and I think with Haunting Me, especially, um the lyrically there are points within that song where there will be certain things that come up in the frame that match exactly what the lyric is saying and that was very deliberate that was something that um ollie and um as in the not filmographer me. not, not, not <laughs> ollie and all of us kind of discussed prior to actually filming and then when he was through the editing process and he really sort of understood exactly what we were trying to do with like trying to evoke some of those feelings and 
he wanted to see all the lyrics in full so that he could fully understand what the song was about. And yeah, I, I suppose for us, it's always been about trying to make everything sort of more relatable, certainly for our audience, to make them feel comforted. Because I think music is very comforting. Um, and if lyrically you can express how somebody feels, it takes them out a period of isolation to, oh, actually, if they're singing about it, then it I'm must the be a bigger problem. Exactly, yeah. 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 Interesting. I think in, in, in regards to um, what you said about how our videos mirror that kind of, um, the, the vocal image as well, um, I think Oceans was one where I, we took a trip down to uh, took Beachy a trip Head. Coast. <laughs> yeah, um, we went down to Beachy Head, uh, recorded a video down there. Um, essentially, not the best location. Looking back on it, um, yeah. in in terms of uh, a social stigma, um, a beautiful location. Um, so unfortunate. where was I was going to ask you about this because it's 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 it looks in pretty incredible. Um, mm. where, so where is it filmed? Eastbourne, it's, wasn't it? Yeah, it's yeah, just outside of Eastbourne, um, a place called Beachy Head, um, which we kind of, I, I think I threw it into the frame as a, as a nice place because I've been told about it previously and looked up some pictures and brilliant, lovely place, absolutely um, picturesque. And the day that we had there was a beautiful day. Yeah, um, awesome. But unfortunately, as it turns out, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a hot spot um, for jumpers. Um, and right. And people who, you know, are, are their aim of the day is to jump off and commit suicide. Um, and this is something that we didn't realize until after we'd already recorded there. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think, you know, there, there was no kind of conscious thought of let's go down to Beachy Head. We were just kind of looking for somewhere with an ocean in view um, and, uh, you know, a nice looking place. Um, but, I mean, as it turns out, it's, it is a lovely place. Um, and uh, fitted the video narrative um, very well. Um, mm. And then obviously kind of took a foresty approach for Russ's part as well. So yeah, it's, it, it's an incredible video. And of course, uh, from the foresty, that must be filmed in a different location as well. So you, you brought it all together to create you know, a really interesting theme and, and feeling that, that you get from it. Where is the forest? Uh, uh, that was uh, yeah, just right. outside yeah, was... Brimley, I think. I think. Yeah, sort of yeah. deep cut, friendly, purple right way. Mm -hmm. I mean, just just the fact that you're all playing there in the forest, and it just it just looks great. And that's the one one thing I love about this is just visually, all of your stuff is is really interesting and very engaging. Um, and an ocean is certainly uh, an ocean is certainly showing that. Um, what's think, what what's next for for your videos? What's coming? Like and 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 when when hopefully will that become? As soon as we've got a new single recorded, we'll do a new yeah. music video. Um, don't really have an idea of a concept as of yet. Um, no. Depends which song we go with. Um, this mm. depends on which song we release first, I think. Yeah. Um, and then it's a matter of, like, like we said, mirroring, mirroring the song's emotions and uh, overall kind of... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the takeaways from the song, you know, mirroring them in a video is what we would we'd then look to do. Um, yeah. So we'd have like a, a um, brainstorming session where, you know, does anyone want any particular scene feature, you know, within the video? Does anyone want it to be more performance based or more um, sort of uh, narrative based? Um, and then, you know, we can kind of put together a, a, a storyboard from there and then go to the likes of Ollie with that and then um, find a venue, find somewhere that is suitable for recording with um, and then get to work on it. And a lot of it, you know, is prepared in advance, but there's also a lot of things that you kind of wing on the day yeah. um, and they can be some of the nicest parts. They're long some days. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised he, there is even that element because everything that you do, it seems to me very planned, very structured, <laughs> you know, you're right together, but you're, there's also elements which you just write, we, we wing it on the day, we make it work. Yeah, I mean, so with the Haunting Me video, for example, with Charlie putting his face in a fish tank, 
Um, <laughs> it was going to be that we would all put our face in a fish tank. Um, Wait for so this. We, we filled up this fish tank with water um and uh you know we got a couple of shots with charlie and we were like brilliant shots but charlie there's loads of spit in the water now so we would have to then individually you know empty the tank and bearing in mind we're in a basement as well so there's no way you can empty it outside you can't without having to walk out some steps with you know 40 kilograms of water um so you know we we were just kind of like We'll, we'll wing this. We'll let Charlie do it. Charlie can just do. You the guys screaming. didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, I did not don't. want to stick my face in your yeah. spitting water. No way. <laughs> <laughs> it's horrible. If you scream in water, it just flushes all your face out, basically. Yeah. Um, and this is something that we didn't necessarily take into account. So obviously, we wanted to do it individually. So you know, because everyone, everyone feels that kind of drowning. You know, things are getting on top of me. Point. Um, and so we all we all wanted to be a part of that, and then we decided very much in the moment that that wasn't the best choice for us. <laughs> I love that reality. That reality suddenly um, struck, and it was just we don't want to be immersed in someone else's spitty water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, I mean, so yeah, there are certain elements that you can you have to change on the day of the video shoot. Um, you know, the just uh, unforeseeable circumstances. Um, well, like weather. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, the potentially lighting issues in the, the venue that we choose, uh, whatever goes on. So you kind of have to just make do. But um, we do go in with a, a pretty regimented plan of what we want to feature heavily in the video. And then we, you know, we may just take a take a lead on what what goes on on the day with the rest of it yeah i remember you met, you let's met. catch fire feeling so ill and between takes i had to like collapse on the floor because it was so hot i had like sinusitis and i was like guys i'm not in a good place to be doing this music video right now i was like keep going <laughs> and there's <laughs> jay in the there. corner with a pot of pasta going you're doing great mate don't worry <laughs> <laughs> i was yeah, happy <laughs> You said, you said that these are quite long days when you go and film. No doubt there's a bit of planning, that go, a fair bit of planning that goes into getting everyone in the right locations to get, to get you all there to be able to do it. What, when we're talking long days, what does, what does that like? Horrible. I mean, yeah. <laughs> me was in one location and I think we were there at 10 in the morning and we left at like midnight. Yeah, it was, yeah. A, it was a long old day. Yeah. That's a what, long did, day. What, what was the one that was filmed in the basement of a church uh, neon, lights. neon lights neon lights neon lights that's the one yeah that was, that was that, relatively that was quick fun video to shoot but yeah. i think it was probably one of the hottest days of the year yeah it was in steaming. central london in the basement of a church that had offices above it oh it was uh, so hot <laughs> it was absolutely like, steaming, yeah. you just couldn't you couldn't get away from the heat you went outside to cool down and it was just hot outside <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, that was that was a fun video as well. It was it a fun was. video. That was good. Just yeah, just just looking at that video now. So so where where was that film? So it was at the bottom. I, think, I can't remember whereabouts in London. Shadwell. Shadwell. Yeah. Well, I like the tobacco docks around yeah, the corner, was... like two roads away. There's a big church, like you see it by like a spire tower, and then um, the builder opposite it had a basement, which is what we filmed in. Um, the yeah. guy we filmed with, uh, Patrick, he had the contact there, and yeah. I think it used uh, to be a crypt. Yeah, we had to move quite a lot of church seats and stuff like that out church of there. Church seats. <laughs> what are they called? Jeez. <laughs> <Jeez. laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I think it was it was called the crypt um, because it used to be, you know, somewhere where you keep dead people. Um, which was kind of somewhat lovely. It, there was it was always in the back of your mind. Like I'm not a, I'm not a um, you know a believer so to speak, but ghosts, you know, <laughs> they're watching a music video happen in the place of rest that they chose, and we're there making obscene amounts of noise. Um, <laughs> yeah, just apologies. A, just an odd situation. <laughs> Um, so, no, so, so, so to finish off then let's let's go almost back to the beginning and we at the very beginning we talked about um an important date that's coming up where you where you have your single coming out 
Um, so just re just remind everyone when that's coming out, where it's going to be available, um, and uh, yeah, how how people can start listening to it. Charlie, <laughs> I'll say it. Fine, I'll say it. Um, the third of July. Um, it will be on Spotify and everywhere that the Reimagined Sessions EP is currently being streamed. Um, it will be the third and final track, and it will be Breathe It In. Yeah. Very good. And we do possibly have something else coming out pretty uh, soonish yeah. after that. So it's all about keeping your eyes peeled, I suppose. Might be before, before. Yeah. Might be before, yeah. It's <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> Say no more on the depends when we get it finished. It's nearly there. Yes, yeah. it's nearly there. Yeah. Maybe if it exists. It may not exist. <laughs> Ooh, the mystery. <laughs> yeah, the mystery. Whoa. <laughs> maybe we should, maybe we should definitely talk again when the, when that comes out. And uh, but, mate, I think you know once we all get out of this the situation we're in, you you back out. You're gigging. Obviously, with uh, B, B level, we'll be back up again. You know, next year. And yeah. uh, you know, we should definitely catch up again in the future and chat some stuff through. It's been, it's been a real pleasure That'd meeting with you all and, and chatting with you. And it's it's been great just learning about your journey as friends and then and then understanding what band that you've come into today and it also sounds like you have great fun you know you have a lot of passion with what you do which really comes across in your music um it's been a real pleasure talking to you today gents thanks yeah, so thank much you for having having us. Us. thank you simon um, all right thank you very much in, oh lovely <laughs> Ali, I've mainly enjoyed your visuals. Uh, I'm, I'm at I, really, your I really didn't think it through. I thought podcast, you know, will be fine. I'll go in the garage, um, and then You'd in be the like garage, flipping your camera around, <laughs> looking there, up. Your yeah, nose. there are various things that will fall from the ceiling at any given point. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just precarious up there. There's just ladders, other stuff, um, and then there's the lighting issue. It doesn't really work. So <laughs> next time, next I thought, time I'll find somewhere better. <laughs> I thought you were just being artistic and cool. Oh, yeah. well, in that case, yeah, totally. At least cool. That's All what I thought it was. <laughs> artistic, Can we speak? artistic and cool, and then just with a hidden danger that something might fall on you at the same time. Absolutely. Have you seen some spiders in that fall, garage? If something's going to fall on anyone, it's going to be me. Like just <laughs> yeah, in any given situation, I'm going to be the one that gets hurt. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be alright. I'll be fine. And, I'm used to it. And I think, and I think maybe as a final point, we, we need to talk about Steve because Steve, of course, wasn't <laughs> able to to join us today. <laughs> poor Steve. And poor Steve got fired. You know, just before we we had today's sessions, and it sounds like he's been reinstated. I think um, we're going to have to reemploy him. You know, I think firing him during during the pandemic would be an unfair move. So we'll uh, yeah. we'll reinstate him. <laughs> do you, do you have a, do you have a special message for Steve that you'd like, like to share? I hope you've been enjoying cutting grass. And how many cans of Stella have you drunk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we love you. Yeah, we love uh, you. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Only because we have to. <laughs> it's unconditional at this point. We don't have a choice. <laughs> Gents, oh. thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Steve, big shout out to you. And uh, gents, hopefully we'll catch up again in the future. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye.